started almost 20 minutes late. Oh, oh, you watching oh that? you were watching the, but yeah. That wasn't DeBost. Mm -mm. Yeah, DeBost. That was, they're having trouble with their PowerPoint. That one was, I think. That was a very good. It was a good seminar. seminar. My granddaughter works for Boy Scouts of America, Diane, and they use Zoom. They're virtually meetings every day, and it's great. Good yeah. they're picking up a lot of stuff, but they had some issues. Mm -hmm. Supposedly, correct them. Because the iPads they had security had to be up in the other room. Yeah. I can hear the most. Um, Pat Zola just I can hear Barb. Are the other board members going to get a call in number? Everyone got the call in number. Everybody got the call in number. It's out of my outbox. It should be gone. Yeah, I know Dwayne and I are on. Uh, guys, you need to type in, I think you need to type in your uh, I, I hear me, I hear your code. I can hear what's in the room. Sounds good, huh? I, I can hear you and the others in the room. I, didn't, re I didn't receive one. You Hold said up. all of us got one. I didn't get one. I didn't either. Do you, do you not, do you still not have it right now? I don't. I've got, I got your email, David. What, Tom? All right. Okay. I got the video link. That's on. I planned on getting it here, but the iPad doesn't work. Okay. Pat? I got the video link. Okay. But I don't have the number. Just the video link. Not the call in number. Yeah, I've not had problems with it. I... Who's that? Pat's on. All right, can we start the meeting? Do we have thumbs up from all? Sounds good. Okay. Should be good. We're going to go ahead and start our um, April 22nd HOA meeting, and we'll start with our Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. All right, just a few reminders to those who are here right now. Let's go ahead and silence our phones. And to all of the owners in video land, uh, we're going to have quite a few discussions today. Please feel free to send in your discussion points, if you have any, uh, via Diane Leffler on YouTube. Correct, Di? Facebook, sorry, Facebook. Um, you know, I just kind of want to start off by, first of all, um, thanking our owners and our residents for the personal responsibility that everyone has taken on over the last five weeks. Um, it just uh, has resulted in a virus-free community, even though we've got a sadness going down the road by half a mile. Um, but everyone has been so diligent in their efforts to keep Cypress Woods Resort virus free. And I thank you and I know the board thanks you and uh, just wanted to give you that little thumbs up on that. We're gonna go ahead and start with our first topic which is going to be finance. David, do you have a delinquency report for us? Um, I will in one minute. I'm pulling I the updated one because a lot's changed. Oh, it did, okay. He's pulling up the most time sensitive uh, totals for you. Um, while we're doing that, Barb, did you want me to go ahead and give a quick financial on yes. that? Did you say yes? Thank you, Hen. Okay, so as of March 31st, here's our financial situation. Uh, it's looking very positive. Our cash on hand as of March 31st is $437,200. Um, our reserve totals on hand are $116,000. Uh, of the seven expense centers we have, here are the over-unders for the first quarter. Under our administrative expenses, we are under 5,400. On our insurance expense, we were under 1,200. Utilities for the first quarter, we are under $1,000. Under our contract expense, we were under 9,200. 
and our salaries are under by $5,400. And again, for the third quarter, our repairs and maintenance expenses are over 100, and our special projects line item is over by 6,300. So when we net that down, we are still under budget for the first quarter to the tune of $10,800. So things are being monitored quite well. Um, we had a lot of expenses go in in the third quarter. Uh, anywhere from the final expenses of the town center renovation was the biggest items that, that we entered into the expense items. Um, but overall, we're, we're strongly in the black. You said the renovation of the town center. Town center pool. Yeah, thank you. Town center pool. Okay, Dave, if you don't have, uh, you have it now? Yeah. Thank you. Um, Sorry, Diane. All right, so currently. Hey, Dad. John? Is the screen share? What do you mean? Uh, I simply say it says it's waiting for a presenter to share their screen in the meeting. I'm not sure if you're showing anything or just talking to it. Okay, yeah, Diane's no, checking. We, we don't see any anyone's screens. We would only see video coming from you. Um, and there's no, no, I'm, I'm saying I don't see your screen. You don't see us is what you're saying. Correct. Okay. You're not missing much, John. Is he on Facebook? <laughs> yeah. John, I think the, the YouTube, because I have uh, our webcam streaming to YouTube instead of through this app, it's um, not, oh, not, I see. not popping o up on Audio there. only. Yeah, I, I don't. Why do we do We that? have it all on YouTube right now, Why but do I don't do want to back out and try and try and get this Why thing. Do yeah, don't on. worry about it. YouTube. You're not missing a whole lot. I, it's just. I've got all the documents. I'll just look from here. Well, no there, there, it wouldn't be on there anyway. There's nothing displayed on the screen. Gotcha. All righty. So, Dave, if you have our 90-day uh, delinquency totals, please. All right. So, we have, it looks like a total of four owners, uh, but one owner does have multiple lots at this point uh, that are delinquent. Uh, the over 90-day total is $5,283.34. Um, but again, that's four owners, and one of them has four lots that are delinquent at the moment. Is that an increase, David, of about $1,000 from the last report you gave? I don't believe so. I think it's down. It was 4000 something. Well, um, no, I don't, I don't think our over 90-day total would have gone up because we're still, we're not in a different pay period. So I'm not sure... Unless it would be late fees, Could interest fees. Bit. Well, there, yeah, there, there's never that many late fees. I, I, I'd have to go back and look at what the last one was. I don't, I don't know offhand when the okay. last report given was. Okay. But it's Thank gone down since the last time we pulled right. it. Right. Dave, what is our total pass, pass due? What is the total pass due? It's... Uh, Five thousand six hundred forty-six. So it's not. It's not much. It's all just the back stuff. That's right. Right. It is much to me. It should be zero. Well, <laughs> sorry. Okay. Thank you, David. Moving on now to governing. Um, as far as our current occupancy, uh, as of last night. Thank you, Diane. Um, our occupancy has dropped from forty-six percent down of uh, last week down to 41 percent this week and i think david um you were going to emphasize uh enforcement of rules and regs during the virus um period here uh right you know i know a lot of people did have to leave in a hurry but um a lot of people are still here and we are still enforcing the rules as we would any other time. Now there are some exceptions. We know a lot of the people that had to get back quickly and didn't get their lots put away. Um, we are giving them a little bit of extra time to make some arrangements and do that. But those notices have gone out to, uh, to everyone who left without securing their lot fully. Um, 
and then when we go around uh, after the deadline given to those people, if it's still in um, sort of a, an unsafe condition for storm season, then we will make other arrangements and move forward with the violation process like we would any other time. Okay, and I might point out too, uh, your administrative assistant, Brittany, was kind enough on those lots that were left improperly closed up that there was a courtesy call given our yes. owners, correct? Correct. Uh, just a courtesy to say, we know you had to leave you know, quickly, uh, but still everything's going to have to be uh, secured and X amount of days to do that. And if not, it would have to be a violation, correct? Correct. And we, we have received some feedback, uh, people saying that, um, you know, weed control and landscaping isn't essential during a virus outbreak. Um, but the state of Florida feels differently. Landscaping is an essential service right now. All of the landscapers are working as they always would. Uh, typically, you only have one person on your lot treating for weeds anyway. It's not like you have a team of people out there coming into communication or contact with anyone. So uh, there really is no reason to not have your, you know, your landscaper already started on taking care of your lot if you're already gone. All of them are still working as if nothing's changed. Okay. All right. Thanks for that update. Okay, we're going to open this up to our discussion now, like all agencies are saying if and when um, certain areas uh, throughout their city or state or community needs to be reevaluated uh, on if we want to open any of the now closed amenities. Um, I've gotten quite a few requests. I think some of you also on the board have gotten some requests to uh, have the board reconsider opening um, the pools. Um, there's a lot of uh, documentation that has been provided that obviously the chlorine uh, kills the, um, the virus, uh, but of course there's still a, a social distancing self-responsibility that would have to enter into place here. So as a board, if anyone has any discussion on this, so if we can um, make a decision today, yay or nay? Yes. Deb. John, yeah. I'll call on you. Is, is, okay. Uh, um, I looked at the, uh, the CDC website uh, uh, just last night, in fact, and their recommendation uh, in this area was that uh, if you do not have any corona in your community, then groups of 10 or less are still fine uh, with social distancing. Uh, that's, that was right from the CDC website. Okay. So, uh, okay. you know, I think if, uh, if we limit the number of people that are in the pool area, okay. then it should be I fine. That's getting together for parties. Is, is, John, I thought that was getting together for parties or dinners or whatever. I didn't see that it referred to pools and open areas like that. It, it, it was just a general thing that I read. Deb? Uh, who, yes, is that Pat or, or, John, or Dwayne? It's me, yes, it's Pat. Thank you. I, I think uh, they've opened up the beaches, and I think if we like we had looked at a, a set of guidelines to follow. I think if we open the pool up and ask people to follow those guidelines with the understanding that if, you know, if it's, it's not going to be followed, and I, I really believe the residents are smart enough to know, you know, what to do and what not to do. So I, I don't have a problem with opening the pool. At this can, point. I, I know I it's hot down there. The board had, has done some discussions on this, Pat, as you know, and um, maybe I, to add on to the discussion, maybe I should state what we would expect as far as what the pool rules would be should we reopen the town center. Number one, because the pool is yeah. so large, um, we would want a maximum of 20 people at any time in the pool area. That's not only in the pool, but also how many are on the deck. Um, to be fair, only a maximum of two hours per person in the pool area, so everyone would have their fair share of a, a session at the pool. Of course, it would be restricted to residents only, absolutely no visitors. 
Um, as you know, we have taken all the pool furniture away for uh, refurbishing. So we would only want you to bring your own pool chair and it must be sanitized before and after use. Sanitization um, stations would be set up around the pool. It will be absolutely mandatory that there's a before and after shower entering the pool, which we have those not only in the restrooms, but as we speak today, the new shower tower in the middle of the pool deck will be operational as well. And of course, the six foot or more social distancing. And should any resident not honor these restrictions, then the pool would have to be closed again to all. Now with that, did you have any I comments? don't think Pat was finished, Deb. I don't think Pat was finished. I'm not sure. Oh. Pat, did you have something else? No, no, no. I, what okay. I was going to say was, yes, I, I realized that, that most people have not seen the suggested guidelines. Okay. Joe? Yeah, the, the <clears throat> Speak up. Excuse me. The one question that I have, and because I caught something on the news, but I didn't hear it all. Have we checked with checked with Lee and McCowney? I think they're opening. There was nothing. I I haven't as of this morning because I know it changes daily. Well, but it can, yeah. Um, because there was something about on Wink that they were. The, the county oh. was going to start opening their pools. I think, Gary, are you going to say something? Well, when he's done. Oh, well, go ahead. He's, he's done. Got information yeah. on it. I'll no, up. I don't have information oh. on that. I just want to tell you my feelings on it. Tighten up to the mic, Gary. I can't get much closer. <laughs> <laughs> Put it in your mouth. <laughs> Unless I bite it. <laughs> I mean, the state put a mandate on stay at home. And when they did that, we agreed that we would abide and we closed everything in this park. That mandate doesn't go off until the end of the month. Maybe sooner if the governor said so. I just feel that if it was important enough to go and close everything earlier in the month, then we should continue to do that until such time as that mandate is lifted. Okay, I think Barb. Are you done, Gary? I'm done. Okay. Um, I agree with Pat. I think that um, our community is intelligent enough to stay away from each other. The things have changed in our local area as far as amount of people that we have heard that are uh, getting the virus. But in this community, we have not had even a sick person that I know of. I think we're... Um, going to have 90 degree weather for a long time yet. There's very few things in this resort that you could do that I uh, would be afraid, would not be afraid uh, to be around six feet distance, of course, but I, that's the only place that I would feel safe to go is the pool. And I think that it's the same as when we were deciding to close it in the first place, I would like to see it stay open, but I think that it's time that we open at least the pool back up. Uh, does anyone else have any more discussion? Uh, Joe? Yeah. Okay. Um, Barb, I agree with you in the sense that, you know, when we closed it, what information we had, absolutely, you know, it would be foolish to have Cross that. I mean, it just, we didn't have enough information. Uh, we since know that the numbers they were talking about were off. We since know that, you know, <clears throat> our governor has left it to the commissioners. So he has one thing, but then each of the counties has, you know, has alterations. And I know that I've been watching Seminole County for personal reasons. And, uh, you know, they went much stricter than, than Lee County did. And they've had fewer people with it and so forth. But they have already stated that as of midnight on the 30, is, this, is, is there? 30 days? April has 30. Yeah, on the 30th. Participants yeah. in the conference, please um, announce yourself. 
Sorry, don't do that. The uh, you know that they've already issued the new proclamation that they were letting businesses open and so forth. Uh, you know they have um, thirty percent occupancy of the space, six foot distancing, ex et cetera. So uh, our governor has a commission that was formed Monday. They're supposed to have some information coming shortly at a state level, um, but they're trying to bring the state back. We have dropped position on the on the list in Florida. We're now eighth or ninth, so we've dropped quite a bit. Um, I think it's time to realize that we have adults here, and we should put the pool, the town center pool, back in operation, and take baby steps and just keep. Keep keep working. Okay, Bob, you just have to, yeah, Deb. Just to add to that, what you said, Joe. The local news this morning announced that Lee County is opening the parks again. Okay. They open today, so Correct. that's a big start. Yes, that is. Do we have any more discussion on the board? Anything from the? Uh, yes, we do have a question from Video Land. One moment. Well, she's checking that out. Deb. Deb. It's next. Oh. Deb. Tim Lockhart said, Tim Lockhart said, if someone doesn't follow the guidelines, ban them from the pool, not close the pool to everyone. I agree. Joe? I would like to make a motion, since we motioned to close it, I'd like to make a motion that we reopen the town center pool. Okay, we need a second on the motion to reopen town center pool only. Second. We'll take a vote alphabetically. Barb Burge? Yes, open. John Genovese? No, closed. Joe Regenstein? Open. Dwayne Truitt? Opposed, no. Gary Washburn? No. And Pat Zolo? Open. Okay, we have a 3-3 three, three tie that requires my vote, which I will vote to reopen the town center pool only. Now, David, how long will you need to get it in order? Um, we can open it tomorrow morning, I think, pretty easily. Uh, Chris is fixing the shower today. We'll be in full business tomorrow. Okay. David, will you also have the uh, necessary sanitation products out there for yes. everybody to use? Okay. We will also have pool rules posted, all right? And uh, I might note that even when our new loungers are arriving, you have suggested that you will not be putting those out. They will be stored in the town center until we get an all clear through the city, correct? Yes, until then people can bring their own chairs or towels. Excellent. To Excellent. All right, um, I would like to just quickly visit the shuffleboard courts and the tennis court, tennis and pickleball courts as well. With the parks, uh, Lee County Commissioner, Park Commissioner is opening those parks. Um, I do think, let's have a discussion now if we do it at the same time of the pool or if we're going to hold off on that a little bit. So I would like a board discussion as well as again, video land. You're, I'm opening up to anyone's discussion on opening the shuffle, tennis, and pickleball courts. Comments? Well, I think there's a bigger risk there because you do have contact with the balls and stuff, changing hands. You, you can't sanitize the ball every time it changes hands. But I think that's a bigger issue for me, anyhow. Any other discussion? I kind of feel the same way as I would the pools. I feel it is different as well. Tennis, I have a, I have a hard time arguing that position. Shuffle, on the other hand, <clears throat> um, if everyone has their own equipment, of course, that means their stick, they probably do. Um, we have enough practice pucks, I believe, that if everyone you know, was assigned a set that they're responsible for cleaning and using, mm -hmm. you, will, you would eliminate the 
you know, other people handling those pucks. You can't do it in tennis, obviously. Mm -hmm. But I uh, agree, Joe. But I think that might be the answer to get shuffle open. Mm -hmm. uh, well, and I, I would say that they need to. They would sign out. Mm -hmm. I guess it's four pucks is what they have, and they have to sign them back in, and mm -hmm. they're responsible for them. Well, I do have a request from the um, chairman of the shuffle group, Virgil Collins. He has surveyed the the, um, uh, the shuffle players. There are only 12 left in the park right now. Uh, and there are, I'm sorry, there's eight left in the park. There are 12 courts. They are proposing that only every other court is allowed between them. They are also stated that everyone does have their own equipment and that it would be sanitized before and after use as well as the benches and that we would set up a sanitizing station in the shuffle tennis shed for them to clean their uh, benches and their equipment so you are talking such a super low amount of people here um, personally I don't think I don't feel there's a problem opening up the shuffle because it's it's really more of a no contact sport um, tennis um, I'm partial, as you know, because I love the game, but I do understand with the balls um, that those are picked up and there is sweat involved in the tennis mm -hmm. activity. I do understand that. Um, but I would like to voice my opinion that I do feel that the shuffle should open. Diane, you have something from the video land? If you open the shuffleboard courts and the tennis courts, will this be for residents only? Absolutely, 100%. So with tennis, um, I, I think at this point, and I, I don't know how, how it would be possible to enforce, but if you're playing with you know, your spouse or your, you know, a good friend that you're already having breakfast and coffee and dinner with every day, even during this outbreak, which people we know still are, you know, what's the risk if you're not playing with strangers? Yeah, you're sharing sweat between the people you're playing with, but you're living with those people likely, or, you know, you're in close contact with them anyway. So I, I, I don't play tennis, but I, I don't know that, uh, you know, there would be much of a chance of external risk. I can tell you that there's not more than six tennis players left here in the community. So you were talking such a small, Mm -hmm. small amount and right of the six two is a husband wife team that doesn't play on leg play right. and they go out every afternoon just for the exercise mm -hmm. so I mean I, I think that is something we have to consider if we were at full season absolutely not right but we are, we are at such a minute amount of our population right now that has an interest in that now I don't I can't speak for pickleball because I don't play pickleball and I don't know how many people do um, but again, um, I guess we need to bring this discussion to a conclusion if we oh, do. I have one more thing to throw in the Oh, pot Joe here. has another point. Uh, if you're going to do tennis or pickleball, it should probably be singles only because that's the only way you're going to keep your six foot rule. With doubles, it'd be very difficult to keep that spacing. True. Understood. Understood. Diane, you have more? I have questions. They came in late because there's a delay about the pool. Sure. They do want to know if the pool, what the chlorine level is now, and if it'll be tested before it's opened. And then Sue Denzer wanted to know, will the chlorine be tested three times daily? No, but we do have active chemical monitoring in the pools now. Um, we installed a computerized uh, chemical feeder system that analyzes real time what the chlorine levels and acid levels are in the pool and can adjust on the fly. Um, the health department um, mandates a level between two parts per million and 10 parts per million. Uh, our chlorine level coming into the park is one part per million anyway. We're already halfway there. Um, it, so it, it doesn't take much chlorine, but it will be within the uh, recommended levels. And we have, like I said, computer monitored equipment that uh, ensures that. 
one more hey, Dad. thing. And the, and, the, and, and the equipment works. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I just want to to David. I want to piggyback onto what David said. Um, Miss, one of our long-term owners and pool specialist, Jean Caustic, spent time with David and Chris in the last week or so, and he has trained them on how to properly read pool readings. And there is a chart maintained now, along with what Pool Pros records, Chris and Dave record as well. So that's another layer of protection. And I think, Barb, you're next. Uh, yeah, just to add to what David said and, and, and Deb said, in our investigation when the board was trying to decide whether or not we were going to close the pool, um, we did find someone gave the report that the amount of chlorine in that thousands of gallons of water is not enough to kill a virus to begin with. It has to be, according to our health department rules, at a certain amount, and David ensures that it stays at that amount. But to tell you that it's going to kill a virus or a flu or anything, I don't believe we can say that. Did you? I'm sorry, did you have something, or Dave, did you want to respond to Barb? Yeah, um, Barb, you're, you're right. So if, if you're using a chlorine solution as a sanitizer, uh, and I think Dwayne brought this up at the last meeting, they recommend it's a 50, fix, 50 sure. mixture, not you know a couple parts per yes, million. Yes, it is. Um, but that's if you're spraying it on a surface and wiping it away. When you're actually in the pool, I mean, the, the pool is – those. Chlorine levels are designed to kill bacteria and viruses mm -hmm. over time, or at least to keep them from growing out of control. Again, there's definitely no guarantee. You know, public pools are, are never going to be 100% clean because you don't know who's going in there and what they're doing in there. But um, there, there's definitely no increased risk as long as you're maintaining chlorine levels in that zone. And then, exactly. again, be smart outside of the pool. I think, Joe, you have a discussion. Yeah, one other point. I don't know that it's been an issue, but considering what we are ma ma dealing with, I think we need to mention to people no animals in the pool. A dog is the equivalent one? of 20 people going in a pool Okay. on the chemicals. Thank goodness. I don't think we've had that issue, I but it's a matter so. of record. So. Joe does not want any animals in the pool. This <laughs> is one of those... Trivia facts. <laughs> I just want to rib you. Now. Hey, what, Deb. Jo, uh, John, yes. Yes. Yeah, I'm looking at the um, at a report from the CDC, and they say that uh, there's no coronavirus been detected in any treated drinking water. So I think just a little minute amount of uh, chlorine in the drinking water is killing the virus. Good point. Right. It may not kill it in direct contact, but it does at least keep it from, uh, you know, growing and spreading. And again, we've tested our drinking water in the park, and it's one part per million of chlorine straight from Lee County Utilities. So can we go back now to shuffle and to tennis courts? Is there a motion that we can reopen with restrictions will be posted for the shuffle courts. I will make that motion. Joe's making a motion. May second. we have a second? And Barb seconds. I will now take a vote um, alphabetically. Barb Burge. I agree to open them. John Genovese on the shuffle courts. Uh, is this for shuffle or both? No, shuffle, shuffle only. Tennis. Shuffle only, yes. Okay, Joe Regenstein? Yes. Dwayne Truitt? Yes. Gary Washburn? No, on the same reasons for the pool. And Pat Zolo on the shuffles? Yes. We will be reopening the shuffle courts tomorrow after we post restrictions and that the sanitation stations are set up in the shed so they can clean their personal equipment. Let's go to the tennis pickleball. I need a motion, and if it'll be clearly stated on the tennis. I will make a motion that we reopen tennis with singles 
actually, let me re rephrase that. We can do pickleball, I guess, if you play singles and pickleball too. But it's gotta be singles only. We have a motion to reopen the tennis courts for single play only. Second. Barb Burge seconds. I will now take a vote alphabetically. Barb Burge. Open. John Genovese. Yes, open. Joe Regenstein. Yes. Dwayne Truitt. Opposed, no. Gary Washburn. No. And Pat Zolo. Uh, go ahead. I might as well. <laughs> <laughs> the vote is four to two to reopen the tennis courts. They will reopen tomorrow with restrictions posted on the gate as well. All right. With the same conditions. Well, excuse me, Deb. The same conditions. If it's found to be violated, they close immediately. Yes. Wait, closed immediately or that person removed? That person the removed. The person that violated Pat would be removed, okay? Okay. Thank you. All right. I went out of line here. Thank you, Barb. Barb is going to talk to us now about our storage space rental policy. Uh, there was a little bit of discussion and a confusion, and, and I think she wants to clear everything up on that. Uh, well, uh, there's been an additional confusion, too, after we talked. But anyway, <laughs> um, on the uh, Cypress Wood storage area policy, I know that we had a survey about the containers and how they would be, um, the way that the people that voted, voted to, um, have the rule read like this. There's been a lot of uh, disgruntled people about it, namely the people that have storage containers out there. So I'm not so sure about what we might want to revisit that again, but the way that it came out uh, last year for the survey is uh, the HOA will maintain a wait list of owners wanting to lease a space as they become available. The name on the top of the list will be offered the available space. In other words, if I move out and I have to turn my space in, they'll be offered that available space. If there's a container on the space, the owner of the container is allowed to try to sell the container to the incoming lessee. If they do not wish to buy it, the owner must remove the container from the storage area when they leave. We don't have these words in there, but it's the same as if they had a motor home or whatever. They only are leasing the space, not anything else. Um, so with that said, that's the way the storage area policy reads on number five. Also, we added the owners on the wait list may be allowed to turn down a space if it is not the one they want and retain their position on the list for the next available space. But then it'll go down to that person and it'll be offered to them. And a perfect example that just happened with lot number seven. Number seven is the first space on your right as you go into the storage area. And that space is right on the edge of the driveway, the entryway. Most people didn't wanna be by that entrance even though it has the same amount of space that you can extend out as the number eight, nine, and 10, and so forth. They were concerned that what they have, if they had a 40-foot motorhome and put it in there, that it would be uh, more susceptible to getting run into as someone made the corner. So we had about five people on the top of the list Turn down number seven. If I'm not mistaken, Brittany had to go down to number seven or eight to get someone to take seven. So that's an example of why we said, okay, those seven that didn't want to be on that corner could at least maintain their space for the next one that comes up, which I think is only fair. I may be wrong, but anyway, that's the way that is set. Also on number two, um, it says owners may lease only one space. Well, some of our owners have thought that that means, okay, 
Barb Burge rents space number six, but if Arthur was still alive, of course, my husband could also rent another space and another space because we have multiple lots. And he's an owner, I'm an owner. So to clarify this, if you are a couple, you have allowed one space. It doesn't matter if you have 14 lots that you owned. There are only 51 spaces available out there. And I might add that, believe it or not, there are 37 storage containers in that small storage area. So what, 75% more than that is storage containers. Has nothing to do with what I'm talking about, but little trivia. Owners may lease only one spot. That means Barb and Art Burge or Diane and Dean Leffler can only rent one space, one space per family. So I just wanted to clarify that because we had another um, spouse want to be put on the wait list and they already have a space. We have two people that are a couple that have different last names and they also own two lots. I'm just saying only one space to you guys is going to be allowed unless we get more spaces added on and we decide to change that rule. Right now, you can't be on the list if you already have a space, a storage space. Any questions? No, but I think you're absolutely correct on that. Um, everyone has to give a little when we don't have a lot of space to offer. Right. And for one owner to have two or three rental spaces in the storage area just doesn't seem to be, you know, a fair way of, of trying to satisfy everyone's request to, to own a space. With that too, Deb, I'll also add that our grandfathered in rights are remaining in the storage area policy. And specifically, it is down, <coughs> excuse me, to three different lots that own or that rent two spaces. Grace Johnston of lot D63, she has a lease on space 20 and 21 because it was there before this rule was in place, so she will have that until she turns those in or no longer is in Cypress Woods. Dennis Scheidt, same way, of B103, had a lease on 46 and 47, so he's grandfathered in. Frank Ferreira of D67 has a lease on 49 and 51, and unless they want to turn one of those in, they can have it as long as they're here. Also, um, there are only two spaces left that were co-owners before we said, no, you cannot be a co-owner uh, on a lot. It's one lease to that person. They can allow someone to use part of their space, but as far as Cypress Woods is concerned, it's leased to one person. Um, the two lots that are still, or the two places that are still co-owners, grandfathered in, are Jim Roop of A33. He's co-signed on space number 15 with Jack Schatzel of A35. Harry Stenson of lot D162 is co-signed on space number 38 with Frank DiMaggio of D19. All righty. Thanks for clearing that up. If anyone's got concerns, you can check with Dave or Brittany in the office, and I think it was explained well. We're moving on now. We're going to talk for just a second uh, about owners who manage their own lot rentals. Folks, um, as you know, the HOA does not make one penny off of your lot rentals. However, what the HOA does ask is that every owner who rents their lots out comply with the request that you pre-register your owner, your renter at least seven days in advance using the pre-registration form with the office. There's many reasons we do this. First of all, to make sure the RV coming in is compliant with our rules and regs. We make sure that the occupants don't exceed the amount of uh, occupants allowed per lot. We make sure that the pets 
do not exceed the number or the breed that are logged per our documents. Um, and then we also let the gate greeters know when they're coming in because that way we can present them with a welcome packet if the office is closed on the weekends and they're not left stranded with knowing nothing about this park and believe me, it happens, it happens so much. But remember, the HOA does not make one penny off of the profit that you make off running your lots. Let me tell you that we only have 25% compliance rate by these owners sending in pre-registration. That is a huge disappointment for what you expect the HOA in the office to do. I have requested a time study of Brittany, our administrative assistant, of Angela, our mail clerk, and Diane Leffler, our social activities director, to specify each task that they have to do over and above their normal job responsibilities to accommodate a proper orientation and greeting and education of your renters, even though you should be doing it. So as soon as I get the time study and figure a cost involved in that, the board will be discussing the opportunity for us to recoup those fees to us. So I just wanted to give everyone a heads up. And if we can get the compliance rate up, considerably, it will help the flow and the experience that your renters have here in Cypress Woods. Any comment? I'd like to make a comment, Deb. I can remember when we first were trying to go over this uh, rental form that our owners were supposed to have their renters fill out and turn into us. And at that time, we were adamant about the fact that if they, and once it was in place, and it has been for what, two years now? Mm -hmm. And once it was in place, if they didn't comply, we don't allow that renter in until, it, until they do. I know, Brittany has our administrative assistant. Uh, believe me, she is one of the most polite people we've ever had at that desk. She handles them with care and ease, even though those people are so frustrated when they walk into the office that they, they have no idea what the rules and regs are, how do I get a key, what's my gate, gate pass code, et cetera. It just goes on down the list. Brittany invests a long time. So it's certainly not the renter's fault, that's It is not, for sure. but you know what? I think the HOA wants everyone that comes through our gates to have a po positive experience. And so we'll do the time study. Let's see where we come on this. We'll keep the lines of communication open to our owners on this issue. And uh, we'll, we'll see where we end up. Okay. Hey, Deb. John. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I would just like to add to that. Uh, travel days, as we all know, are very stressful days. I mean, you know, we're in this because we love to travel and all that, but they're still stressful days. It would just seem that as an owner, I would want to do everything I possibly can to take a little stress off that traveler that's coming to rent my lot. And if a simple matter of filling out some paperwork helps make it a less stressful day, you know, make it a less stressful day for your uh, renters. Point well taken, and I know uh, in the months to come, that the board will be having some very um, uh, much needed but encouraging discussions with our developer on the expectations that, that they're going to have as far as the experiences that their owners and their renters have as well. And we want to work parallel with their expectations and also our expectations. So this is uh, something that needs to be discussed sooner than later and we need to get something in place, okay? And David, I, I'm gonna add as well, Cypress Woods is not a stopover campground where you stop in and hope there's a place to rent. These are planned, leased spaces. And yep. as, as far as the county is concerned and the guidelines, if you lease your space out by the day, by the week, by the month, 
you can be fined by the county and you have to pay, they don't call it a bed tax, but it's a certain tax that you have to pay to the county if you're going to allow someone on your lot for less than six months in a day. So keep that in Good mind. Point. Good point. It is called a tourist tax. Tourist, tourist tax. tax, thank you. That's right. Okay, moving on, we're going to go to our committee oversight reports now. And the first committee we'd like reported is the Art Committee, Architectural Requests Committee. And John Genovese, you're on oversight on that. Yes, uh, the uh, Art uh, Committee is uh, actually uh, still working uh, and quite well, I might add. Uh, they're doing roughly five uh, approvals or analysis, whatever you want to call them. Um, a week and uh, have over the last four weeks so uh, things are things are uh, going well in that group excellent do you have a report excuse me Deb do you have a report John of how many are still open and for how long I do not have that report I can say it's something that we uh that we should know I'll certainly have it for the next one David has it John hold on he just said oh okay thank you there are currently 141 open ARC requests. Oh, gee, many. That's ridiculous. It is ridiculous. So, right, we, we are still allowing them. Um, they're open for one year from the date of approval. Uh, Brittany goes in and she closes them out, you know, within a week or so of them um, expiring. And before she does that, she'll reach out to the owner and say, you still have an open ARC request that's expired. Is this complete or is it just an unfinished thing and we need to close it out as incomplete? Uh, but they all get closed out after they hit the year mark if the owner hasn't told us that they're complete and closed it out on their John, own. John, could you possibly discuss this issue with the ARC committee and come up with a recommendation that is that 12 month expiration realistic? Um, or does it need to be rediscussed? Um, it just seems like an awful long time for a project to be approved and maybe not completed till a year later. And things can change in one year, no doubt about it. I, I think, Deb, probably one of the things that you'll find, if we wait until that year expires, maybe um, the the um, art committee could uh, either make a phone call to these people, send out a request. It could be that they're already completed. You find that out a lot. And they're still in there because people didn't turn it in that they planted that tree or they took that tree out. Right. Brittany does do that. Before she closes them, she calls to see if it's I complete. I heard you say that, yeah. that it, before the year's in, end, end right. she does. But like if it is six months from now before it to end, Maybe we could contact them either by phone or whatever, email. We have all the email addresses to say, hey, I still have an ARC request on my active 141 uh, ARC request for a tree that you were supposed to plant. Did mm -hmm. you plant that? Probably they did. Yeah. Well, let's, John, if you would, as oversight, discuss this and make a recommendation from the ARC committee to the board, please, okay? But yeah, because I was going to say a year just seems ridiculous. Yeah. You yeah. get a house put in less than that yeah. time. Yeah. And, John, you're still awake. Oh, we have a question from Video Land. Um, on a comment, Randy Payne mentioned or says, we voted that 12 months was too long and did vote for a max of six months, then reapply. I don't think that was passed. I think that was supposed to be in the new rules and regulations, but we never approved those sections of the rules and regulations. Right. So we can go ahead. Uh, ARC is a policy. So we can go ahead and, and uh, get John's recommendation on that. So, John, you're still up. If you could give us an oversight of the facilities committee. Uh, yeah, I don't have anything new to report other than... Uh, uh, I believe David's going to report on the pool and deck and so forth at the Welcome Center, but nothing new to add to that. Okay, excellent. The next committee is the five stars. Did somebody say something? Do you want me to report on on the pool deck now as part of that? No? Okay. We'll, we'll do it in the maintenance section okay. if that's okay. Um, on the five star committee that we've created to help create five star standards, um, their work has been put on hold until all of the um, uh, businesses uh, 
or companies that they need to get bids and pricing on for some of the projects that we hope to accomplish. So it's just on hold until the virus is, um, you know, the ban is lifted. On the grounds, I believe that is David, right? Uh, I guess I'm the grounds committee, yes. Um, the arrow map, I think we have that, don't we? Uh, yeah, there is a map in everyone's packet showing the areas that are treated by Arrow currently uh, that was just approved at maybe not the last meeting, but the one before, uh, and we have had our first treatment. Uh, there are a few areas of concern that didn't make it into that first uh, round, uh, namely the memorial uh, circle and cul-de-sac area and the area directly across from the uh, town center. Uh, we do this side of the road, this, basically this whole block that the town center building is on, but not the very high visibility shrubs and grass directly across the street from this entrance. Um, I'm meeting with Kyle this week from Arrow. He did give me a price on pest control only down in the cul-de-sac to help treat for grubs and hopefully pre prevent some of those armadillos from uh, ripping up everything. <laughs> Look, it's, yeah, I, I don't know if anyone saw it, you're laughing. It was horrendous. I mean, it, there it were over like the... 50 holes there, David, yeah. and you guys filled them in. And don't you know there's not a one so far? And that's been what a week ago that y'all filled them in. Yeah. So they are they're taking up someplace else's space. Well, that's good news. Maybe it, maybe Looking you ran yours. out of grubs. Would you say? Maybe you ran out of grubs. Yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> the ground is dry, so there probably isn't a whole lot for them to eat there. Uh, the other concern, though, um, when the landscapers looked at it, he he thinks that. A lot of that was not armadillos, that it was pigs. It looks more like mm -hmm. the, no, what a pig it's does. Not. No, it's not. I talked well, to I know, someone that knows, and well, they... I know you've seen armadillos, yeah. but... No. Okay. Pigs too. Yeah. See? Yeah. It... Well, in, in any case, uh, we're meeting with Arrow this week to get... He gave me, like I said, a, a price just for pest control over there, $240 a year to treat that circle inside and out for, uh, for grub control just added on to our uh, current contract. What about the other areas that are not under the Arrow project? Such as? Well, according to the map, there's quite a few, David. Well, yeah. right, there, you know, other than th these uh, high visibility areas, we have a lot of common area that's not included. Mm -hmm. the, the areas- I'm across, from, across from the town center. Right. We, we don't have pricing on that yet. You know, Kyle has to come on site and look at these because those concerns came up after he was out here to give us a price for the uh, the cul-de-sac uh, at the memorial circle. Um, but he'll be out here this week, so we should have some idea of what to do with these additional common areas that didn't make the first cut. And there's yeah, one, That's two, a high visibility. Oh, sure. Yes, it is. I went out yesterday, Pat, if I may add. I went out yesterday and drove around to all the common areas. And um, I don't know if any of you have looked at the entryway all the way up um, Cypress Woods Drive mm -hmm. on both sides. It's like bare in some spots mm -hmm. along the lakeside mm -hmm. and then coming into the welcome center in that little section by the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. The middle island that is the flower bed in the entryway, that grass is treated by Newell. It's taken care of. It gets water, and it is perfect. It's beautiful grass. There's nothing wrong with that. I don't understand why that middle section can look like that and then both sides be almost bare. And it goes all the way up past the lake. You turn Bar. the corner to the right after, at the town center street, you turn to the right, that whole left side along the back side of those D1, 2, 3, mm -hmm. 4, 5 lots, mm -hmm. it looks like it's a dirt road. Mm -hmm. You talk about visible Bar. spaces, that's the most visible to anybody that comes in here. And I would think we would Bar. be, yes, sir. I think. Part of the problem is that area has been neglected so long that what they have done was killed off the weeds to try and now and get, I believe what they were telling us at the meeting when he made the presentation, 
till off the weeds first and then fertilize it and try and get the grass to go. And then if they can't get it going fast enough, then they would do some plugging or overseeding. You're the reason exactly that looks right. so bad That's right correct. now is because they've killed off all the weeds. That's correct. And they also said that, and the main reason why the board agreed to switch contractors in the first place is because they also said that there are a lot of areas that will have to be totally ripped out and taken care of um, to get new uh, turf, new whatever put in there. And I guess I have to know, and this is a question for you, Deb, since that was the plan and we planned to do that, to take care of what grass we could to salvage it now, fertilize it and get it like it's supposed to be, why would we, why would you go ahead and prioritize the B circle area by yours and John house and take out that grass? It's totally getting renovated. We were told nothing was gonna be rejuvenated without us discussing it, without it being a second thing to, to deal with. Right now, it's try to get everything as green as we could. Why would we do that in B? Well, first of all, Mr. John McCormick and Bob Lukes, who are owners here, they took on the task because they were experts in these areas. Circle B, yes, it just so happens to be in front of my lot, but it wasn't chosen because of that, Barb. That area was chosen because it's in front of Mr. McCormick's lot as well, and he can watch it closely. Um, yesterday, that area had all of the weeds weed whacked down to roots, and then they put, I don't know what the height of the topsoil was, and then they put in sod. This is the one and only test area right now. All the sprinklers have been cleaned and cleared. They have been redirectioned, and they're on a certain timer to make sure that that sod can live um, appropriately, or try to live and make it. This is the test area. There will not be any other areas done until we are we can be um, absolutely certain that the way that Newell is going to cut those with the proper cutting machines, proper sharpening of the machines, proper height, and then the proper custom formulated fertilizer by arrow and pest control can be applied. And then if all of those expectations are met, we should have a beautiful test area there. So it has nothing to do, Barb, with where I live, and it happens to be at the lot. So it, if that's what you're insinuating. No, I'm not. Okay. It has to do with the fact that John McCormick, and I, I listened to the meeting last month just to be sure I thought I heard it right, and I did. John said they are still working on, it's almost word for word, I wrote it down, they are still working on and will get back with us to discuss the rejuvenation areas. Bob said almost the same thing at the end of his presentation. Otherwise, I don't think we would have had the switch to arrow if we didn't know what was going to happen. Barb, I have kept this board completely appraised of every discussion we've had with expectations set to Newell as well as I prepared this map with the contract to the board. As far as that area being a test area, I personally approved it. I know. With David for $1,000. I have the authority, I felt it was the right thing to do, and I still feel it's the right thing to do. Presidents on this board have to have certain abilities to make decisions to to certain price limits. $1,000 is within David's uh, managerial job description to approve it, as well as any president, past or future, has the right to approve this. Discussion ended on this. I have clearly understood this. Anyone else? Okay. <laughs> Joe? 
I don't recall that John or Bob addressed it, but now that we're into this, do we have a any kind of a timetable or a, where we are hoping to see start seeing results or? Can you answer that, Dave? Yes, uh, Bob and John don't have the timetable, but uh, Arrow One, um, you know, we, we won't see real results until irrigation is adjusted and, you know, increased everywhere. Uh, but also, we can never run enough irrigation here to improve from the condition that we're in, especially after this long dry season. Uh, once the rain starts, rainy season, it, you know, it should take, they say, a month or so during the heaviest rains with their treatments that we see which areas are going to respond to the treatment and you know visibly start to improve i mean you know they'll turn from weeds to grass and from brown to green or we'll know which areas you know in the summer if they're not improving with rain and irrigation and their treatment that those will be the areas that need the renovation but right now you know nothing it's very difficult to make something uh, come back from the point that it's at now where it's been neglected for however many years. Uh, and Barb, to your point, you know, that front island area there, I think that grass has been replaced at some point in history, whereas along the main road, if it's been done, um, you know, it was a long time ago and the irrigation there probably wasn't 100%. Right now we do have irrigation there. The heads are working. Uh, they have pretty decent coverage but we may need to add you know some different types of rotors and, and some different things there but that's all over the summer project and hopefully with the rains we'll turn green and once the rain stops we'll have all of the irrigation coverage mapped out and under control so we stay green a little bit longer before it goes dormant like it is now along that line david um and kind of along the same subject do you know when your guys have uh, inspected the sprinkler heads at the Welcome Center? I mean, right up at the building? Uh, I don't know the last time Chris has cleaned them. We know that they're all on and working, but they, I don't know if they've been cleaned recently. I'm not talking about cleaning. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about yesterday when the water was running out there. I didn't have any flags to, to post it, mm -hmm. but there's either four or five sprinkler heads there. One is right up at the building, mm -hmm. and it was like a geyser. The head is busted off of it. Yeah. There's, a, huh? Uh, yeah, that happens. I, I mean, know it does. There are four other spaces, if I'm not mistaken. One of them, the sprinkler head is clear down in the hole, and it's off, mm -hmm. but it's just gushing water clear around the side of the building, another one is just like that. There's two of the sprinkler heads that out there that are hitting a trickle to a little bush that's right beside it. Yeah. And that grass looks like crap. Right. Yeah, uh, again, I don't know when the last time those were checked, uh, but that is you know, at the top of our list now that we've done the, uh, the valve project in the community that took you know, Chris and I the better part of a week and um, you know, some other things that are going on right now. He's installing some shower towers and getting us ready for the pools to reopen. But um, again, my, my biggest project remaining right now is the irrigation system. Chris and I are going through marking all of the common areas, uh, what zone handles which areas. Uh, we'll do wet checks together where we go out and turn it on and he can, you know, see you right there. You need to turn the water on up there at the office whenever Chris gets a chance to just look at that. Well, that that's, a, that's exactly what it's we're... It's such a waste of water for one thing. Yeah. We're going to go through, again, map out all the zones, but at the same time, make sure that every head is working and that we're getting the right coverage. So if and we that's need to you're put talking about for the owner's heads, lots, right? That's your project for checking to make well, sure where the water's going there. That That's a, sort of a wish list over the summer project, but the first step, which will be happening you know, sooner now, as soon as uh, you know, Chris finishes the showers and getting us ready, uh, it's doing the common areas first. We wanna make sure that our common area, everywhere that's being treated by Arrow is being irrigated and sufficiently. Can I, before we take a video um, question, I, I wanna piggyback on what you're saying. Um, and Gary, I know you know it because you're, you're working on the PM program with this. Part of the PM program for Chris, okay, is that there will be monthly irrigation PMs in our common areas where he is required, designated by a certain zone, 
that he will manually turn on the sprinklers, he will test the direction, he will test the flow, he will test the cleanliness of the heads. This has been void. This is why we're putting it on a PM program, which we're gonna roll out May 1st. So that hopefully Barb will satisfy what your much valid concerns are on that. While we're talking about that too, Deb, and you talk about drought weather and not having irrigation and probably never will in some areas, they also talked about, Bob and John talked about when the grass is planted, the type of grass that we're gonna plant. Kyle himself, that's supposed to be the expert, recommended Bermuda grass. Bob does not like Bermuda grass, according to him and talking up here. But you know, maybe we don't like it, but if that's what's gonna tolerate drought, maybe that's what we need to go with. And if I'm not mistaken, it looks like um, St. Augustine over there that is the side that you're putting around the bee, is that right? I believe that is correct, but that's why it's a test area. That gets full sun. The Kyle recommending Bermuda was not for areas like that. Those small islands, um, and really any of the islands that have been renovated should have enough irrigation to run or to, to use you know should have actual grass right the, the saint augustine i guess is the preferred grass there are areas um, where he mentioned bermuda was actually on the cul-de-sac uh, in d section without the gazebo the one that's just uh, you know, several trees covering it because of the amount of shade and lack of water yeah. there, because there is irrigation on the outer rim of that, but I don't believe there's irrigation on the and, inner part. And we need to move on, but we sure. do have a question from Video Land, Diane. From Rob Zal, is there a possibility of a well to replenish the lakes? We have wells in both lakes that replenish the lake, but we can only pump out of the well the exact amount that we pump out of the lake for irrigation. The wells are not to be used, and this is mandated by South Florida Water Management District, they're not to be used to increase the level of our lakes. They're only allowed to pump in to a, a one-to-one -one ratio of what we pump out for irrigation. They have to be replenished naturally with rainwater. Thank you. Um, the next, I oh, I'm sorry, Joe? So the answer to my question is by the time everyone's back in the fall, we will see these areas should be looking A, A number one, hopefully. Maybe. So yes, that's the goal, but okay. there, there may be some areas that are just too far gone and need replacements. And then, you know, Arrow will make those recommendations. They'll say, listen, we've tried this area. We've hit it with all the fertilizer and weed killer they're not coming back here's what we recommend because of the the you know trees we recommend bermuda because it's full sun we recommend a sod replacement like they did over in the b circle um we'll get those recommendations if there are areas that can't be saved but we'll really know once okay. the rainy season starts okay. do we have any questions from the board members not here no okay Thank no, you. no questions here thank you Okay, the next item is water pressure, backflow, and irrigation, sorry, irrigation cross connection. To give you a little background, um, water pressure in this resort has been an issue for many, many years. We finally have knowledgeable people, management, and advisors taking this very seriously now. And we are looking into why we have water pressure problems um, so David, you've been very involved in this, and I thank you and Chris for the effort that you have given in the last week on this has been nothing short of amazing. So if you would like to explain um, the main Watergate valve exercising that you did and why. Um, well, this started from uh, Dwayne's engineer team that he sent out here. Right. Um, he was nice enough to have his engineers come out and they made it through a good portion of the park. They pulled um, some original, I guess, pre-construction maps that should have had uh, the valve locations on them. And I believe that was pretty accurate. It was better than the list that we had in house. Um, anyway, their engineer came, started at the front of the community and sorry, my screen is changing here. Uh, 
checked every valve to make sure that one, it was fully open and noted if it wasn't. Uh, and then they were also exercised where if they were able to get a key onto it, they first made sure it's fully open, uh, then fully closed the valve to make sure that it's operating properly and fully opened it back up. Um, you know, which is necessary, I guess, to keep the valves from being corroded and closing or, or partially closed. Um, they found, I believe his engineering team found two valves that were fully closed through the park. Now, these are isolation valves. So the way the park is set up for anyone who isn't familiar, uh, it's a loop system where to equalize pressure and to maintain pressure, the park or the, the water lines, the water mains um, circle around the park. So there is only one input, but then it splits off and there should be pressure coming from two different directions in front of every house and going through every valve. If a valve is shut, you're only getting pressure or you know, water flow from one side. So you have reduced pressure, especially if you're the last house on the line before the valve is shut and everyone before you is using water. Um, the system is designed to be open 100%. Right now, we have one valve that the engineers found that was, um, I guess it's, it's damaged in a way and it needs to be replaced. We can't tell if it's open or closed. And then uh, Chris and I found a second valve that we don't have access to because the pipe or the road has shifted over top of it. So the access doesn't line up with the, uh, the valve controller and we can't get a key on there to open it. So we have two valves that are still in question whether they're open or closed. Uh, all of the rest of them are now open. Chris and I found uh, well, several more, I think, uh, four others that were either fully closed or partially closed uh, that are now fully open. So the total amount of main Watergate valves is how many? I believe it's 40. 40, and how many were not exercise to full open uh off the top of my head five there may have been six give or take i just don't have the list in front of me okay but you exercised 16 oh we yeah we we had to um so Dwayne's engineers did everything he could do uh just opening the access and sticking the key in there but there were uh, 20 or so other uh, that either they didn't make it to or that were filled with dirt and we had to clean out the risers above that to access them. Uh, most of those, once we cleaned them out, we found that they were open the way they're supposed to be. So I but want the community to know that David and Chris last week spent 32 hours only over two, two days in 98 degree temperature and humidity. They were in those valves cleaning them out, clearing out rock and sediment. We could have hired plumbers, but these gentlemen wanted to do it and learn the experience, and they saved your community over $3,000 in plumbing, potential plumbing fees. David and Chris, I thank you, the board thanks you, and hopefully the community thanks you for what you did here. Uh, I'd like to ask Dwayne one thing. Please. Now that... Uh, all these valves have been checked and opened and what have you. Uh, do your engineers plan on checking the pressure again at this point, or do they have to wait? Gary, I could answer that uh, before. Dwayne, if you don't mind. Uh, we do have a backflow inspection with Dwayne's engineers. I'm not sure if he was aware of that. That's today, this afternoon. Our main backflow at the front of the community will be inspected. We have our fire hydrant testing, which is where we test the flow throughout the park. Uh, Dwayne's engineers will be here for that, uh, as well as our uh, testing company. Um, so there are there are going to be additional testing done today, this afternoon. And uh, again, sorry, Dwayne, I, I didn't know if you were aware of those things yet. Yeah, yeah, I was aware. Thank you very much, um, David. Uh, also, to answer your question, um, there's really two problems that we're trying to address that are associated with water pressure in the community. One is just the static water pressure that happens when we have everybody in the community during peak season. And, you know, um, as Deb said, there's been complaints about that being relatively low for years now. And that's a, certainly an inconvenience um, at a minimum. Uh, but then there's also another problem, which is really more of a public safety issue, which is we have to be able to produce 
a minimum amount of pressure uh, at a fire hydrant when we're running a fire flow test so that if we're fighting an actual fire in the community that we actually have plenty of pressure to uh, to supply the fire hoses and that also is a problem during our um, fire flow testing that we did uh, a while back it was discovered that two of the hydrants failed actually one hydrant failed the test completely and another and that's the nearest one for supply to uh, section E and then the other test was right on the margin It was literally like within a fraction of a pound of, of failing the test so that's a problem for the safety of all of our residents so obviously we need to get that fixed the valves being shut or partially shut certainly could have contributed to those you know failed tests uh, and now that you know, we're doing the additional um, fire hydrant testing along with the backflow preventer testing. We'll find out if, in fact, we will be able to pass those tests going forward. Um, the the backflow preventer is also a potential cause of low pressure if the check valves in it were not fully opening. And so this test that's being run today is going to check for that. If for some reason it appears that the backflow preventer isn't functioning properly, then you know there'll need to be some sort of repair made to it. Um, so hopefully, as a result of what we've already done, we've got the problem fixed. But we don't know that until we complete the work today. Again, Dwayne, I want to thank you for providing these engineers, the developers, engineers, Peninsula Engineering, to facilitate this in a manner that. If we had to go outside the community for another contractor, we wouldn't have accomplished this as quickly as possible. Barb, you have something? I do, Dwayne. Um, this question is for you or Ed or David. You mentioned that uh, the fire hydrant inspections were done recently and you found two of them, one failed and one so-and-so. Was that from your engineer's testing or was it Wayne uh, Fire uh, Group because Wayne just tested our fire hydrants in October or November. I'm not sure which month, but, and wasn't due to test them again until the end of this year, because it's an annual thing that is required. And when I addressed that, I was told that they're going, going to go ahead and do them again, but then uh, it would be the annual inspection for 2020. But in 19, I don't remember that they found anything. I know prior to that, there was a hydrant in front of C, 40 something maybe, 20 something, that they had to replace. And we, we paid for that to be done. But I didn't know there were two more. Well, the, the testing that I'm referring to is actual official fire flow tests conducted by the Tice Fire Department. Um, they were done at our request as developers um, of, of Laguna Carib, um, basically so that we could prove that we actually do have sufficient fire flow in the community. Um, and so they were actually performed by the fire department. Our engineers witnessed the test. Um, they use more sensitive um, flow and pressure sensing instruments for that test than I think is used in the fire hydrant test. So it's, it's a different kind of test. They're somewhat related, but they're, but they're still not done to the same precision routinely. And um, when we complete the testing today, if things look promising, you know, that, that, that we're getting better performance, we'll have TICE come out and actually run another official set of fire flow tests. Well, I guess I was told whenever this first came up that we had to hire Wayne the first year, and I believe that was 2018. I was told um, that, but, and I even have a letter from Tice Fire Department, they do not do that, perform those tests. We have to hire a private company to do it, which we did. So now are we saying that that private company doesn't do it to Tice Fire Department specs? And, you They're know, two different th tests. I'm right. sorry? There's a fire hydrant test to prove that the fire hydrant operates correctly. That is different than a fire flow test that is done by the fire department, which is done by the department itself, not by a contractor. Okay. Um, 
and and they they have a different test protocol that they use, and they use more um, accurate or sensitive pressure and flow okay. instruments on that test, and that's the test that the fire department says you're good to go. Okay, thank um, you. The fire hydrant test is basically just to make sure that the fire hydrant functions. Gotcha. Thank you. I need to ask the board that we're going to have to speed up some of the discussions just because we have quite a bit more to go through. Not that we want to cut them short, but let's stay to the point, and hopefully we can resolve some of the items still on the agenda. Joe? He said it's a quick one. Yeah. Dave, the pipes that you had to clear out get to the keys mm -hmm. have you capped those so we don't have to go through that again well yes and no they have caps on them but there's no way that you can fully seal them without caulking around it and making it inaccessible okay. um, it, it was just 20 years of rainwater washing in sediment okay the next item on the agenda it has to do with our water retention and the water runoff issue we have and we did have one bid on swill clearing and cleaning inevitably is going to have to be done I have put the project on hold until the backflow test today because if we find it's defective uh, it's an unknown cost it could be very 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 costly I really don't want to go into another cost on the swale issue right now until we know that the backflow that's a priority over swale right now so maintenance Dave, this is almost your whole show on this area, but there's a ton of stuff, but if you can concise it down, we'd greatly appreciate it. Uh, Let's go to summer projects first. Summer projects. Uh, again, my biggest project is irrigation. Chris and I are going to go through, test the system. We're starting with the common areas. We'll make a map of all the common, uh, common area zones and... Um, you know, do the testing and inspection. And again, part of the preventative maintenance program that will be implemented is a wet check, which is typically done monthly, where the zone's turned on, checked, to make sure that nothing is broken, heads are spraying, they don't need cleaned. Uh, that's the, the biggest part of the project. Part of that is also increasing our water uh, or irrigation times and, and volume on people's uh, lots and the homeowner lots as well. Um, our, our system is antiquated when we make changes. Sometimes it doesn't work. It kicks out the whole change and we have to go back to square one. It doesn't tell us what the error is, only that it was rejected. So it's taking a lot more uh, time getting that end done than we're used to. Uh, we could pay uh, two core to send a representative out to adjust it, uh, but that would entail um, you know, them touring the park, making their own map and list and many thousands of dollars. I don't think it's worth it quite yet. Um, that's my big project. And then we have some bathroom issues at both of the pools that need to be addressed. We've made minor upgrades, but there's some other bigger issues that we'll have to tackle over the summer. Also, uh, pool chemistry testing. We next one on the about list. That. Yeah. Um, so, right, we do have those chemical feeders and uh, Gene Caustic has been working with us to uh, help us get on a new program. We just dropped off some documentation yesterday that we'll start implementing now that he gave it to us. Okay. Uh, shower towers and pool furniture update. Um, we should be getting our pool furniture in the next week or so. You know, I don't know how shut down they were because of the virus. They said it shouldn't really affect them, but things change. Um, and again, we're not in a hurry to get that f furniture back and stored in this building. The shower towers, uh, the one was already replaced at the Welcome Center pool. It's operational even though the pool is closed. And uh, at this building, it should be done um, before the pool opens back up, either this afternoon or tomorrow. And they look great, by the way. Oh, yeah. They're very, very nice. Yeah, and w we know that the one uh, has plenty of forward pressure at the uh, at the Welcome Center pool because I got soaked trying to figure out how to use it. He did a test yesterday on his own shirt. You know, he was under it, so. So that works. Um, the Clusia transplant project, is, it's not really my domain, but. Um, you want me to take it? If you'd like, okay. sure. Um, as you drive into the Welcome Center from the main boulevard, uh, if you look to your right and then you look to your left, it's not a pretty sight. It's a uh, raw, uncontrolled <laughs> preserve area. Joe Regenstein is doing major architectural landscaping remodeling, and he's removing 
roughly 18 seven foot tall Carugia screen type foliage. He has kindly donated to the HOA. So you will, he is also having a nursery remove and transplant. And they are gonna be transplanted. Uh, thank you to Mr. and Mrs. Joe Regenstein uh, on either side of the Welcome Center parking lot. And I know that uh, we have to also add irrigation because there isn't any irrigation there. So until the irrigation is bitted out and added, we would be doing manual watering with a drip line so we don't lose these plants. Um, easily, you're talking a $5,000 project that's been graciously donated. So take it from there. We're on to the, this is gonna take a little bit of time, so bear with us. The Along B fence, yes. Well, the B fence uh, project, we, we've discussed it a little bit. Uh, Get our at documents out here. Yeah, prior meeting. So, board, you do have some of these um, these documents in the packet, starting with an email from Steve Newell. Uh, this is, you know, please review the attached estimate. Um, the plant bed or the area in question is about 700 feet total. Um, this just explains a little bit about the estimate, but basically what we're trying to accomplish on the bee fence is to remove any of the dead or dying cypress trees and no, not the dormant ones necessarily. Uh, we have some that are actually dead and not dormant, uh, because the ones next to them are in perfect condition. So, uh, we're working on getting permits for that pre-approved. Uh, to make sure we're allowed to remove these bald cypress trees. Um, whether they're dead or alive, it's very difficult to do. But the goal is to create a screen uh, blocking some of the light and noise from country lakes uh, and to really enhance the view for those people instead of looking at dead trees and tree stumps. Uh, you know, it'll be a nice uh, shrub screen of some sort. Uh, there's a few different options presented to us. Uh, Buttonwoods, uh, cocoa plum, areca, clusia, uh, different areas um, may have different plants, so it's not just one, one row of plants running the whole section. Uh, and then those areas are broken up into uh, different sections by the trees. There are sections of trees. Uh, section A, if you look at the estimate 6175, um, section A is hardwood, section B is different hardwoods. Uh, section C is an area that would be cypress trees removed and then replanted with one of these, uh, you know, either buttonwood, cocoa plum, areca, whatever else. Uh, section D again, trim and thin out the hardwood trees that need to be done periodically and haven't been. Uh, section E, more cypress trees that would be removed and planted with a screen plant, uh, and so on. So we have, uh, seven sections, six or seven sections here, I guess there's seven, um, all broken down on this, uh, mm -hmm. on this proposal. But again, the end goal is to really um, help block out some of that light and noise from Country Lakes mm -hmm. because it, it's bad over there at night when the, these buildings are uh, in full effect and, and working. So Dave, if we look at estimate number 6175, Mm -hmm. That's a total of 67 trees in that area that, first of all, the oak trees have to be trimmed and thinned out because they are getting out of control. Right. Oak trees typically need to be, you know, arbored is the, the proper word, but, you know, they, they're thinned out for airflow and right. to remove the dead growth, uh, you know, shaped into their proper position. The canopy is lifted. That should typically be done either every other year or every third year max. So what, what we're getting on just the 6175 estimate is services for 67 trees to be trimmed and thinned and that's just the maintenance on those trees. So that's $4,500. We should look at that first, correct? Because that maintenance needs to get done. Right, regardless of if we plant anything in, in or place. Or remove now. anything. Right. Right. Okay. Well, this, this does include removal of... Oh, it does. Re that's right. I'm sorry. This Cypress is removal trees. and and trimming and maintenance of all the trees that are back there in that particular section. Right. 
I can't believe it's this that, that, that's, that's, not, that's not what it says in his email. The email says this estimate does not include any extra fees that could come from cutting down any trees or stump grinding needed for the bed planting of 700 feet. So I think this is this estimate is just for trimming. What well, bothers me is this this estimate was. It does say trim. March, you're right. No, March no. 20th, and we get it two days before. It's like three, four pages long. So. It's actually not just for trimming. It says trim and thin out the hardwoods in A, B, D, and F. And the other sections are removal of the cypress trees. Those would be the only trees being removed are the cypress trees that are back there uh, and look dead. And, and there may be a, a pine tree or two that was planted by a homeowner uh, that doesn't belong. It's an invasive tree that shouldn't have been there in the first place. Uh, what that email says is it doesn't include stump grinding if we want to grind those things down and put a plant bed in of some sort or a mulch bed. Uh, so it depends on where we want the screen of plants to be. If it's uh, directly over top of where these trees are currently, it may require stump grinding to get the new plants in place. Uh, and again, there is an extra fee for that, but that's just for the cypress trees, not for David. the hardwoods. David, yes. it clearly says this, esti this estimate does not include any extra fees that could come from cutting down any trees or stump grinding. So it, you're, saying, it, you're saying one thing, but Newell's email is saying something entirely different. No, I think we're saying the same thing. It's saying... If we do this estimate for $4,500 that gives us a price for thinning the trees and separately, uh, you know, in sections C, E, and G, removal of the cypress trees. It, it says we will remove it's those a, trees. We'll flush cut the tree, flush with the ground with a chainsaw and remove it, but you're still left with a stump. And this bid does not include any of the stump grinding or, um, or whatever else would be necessary to prep those beds for planting after those trees are removed, if it's necessary. Okay, may, Read may, the maybe I'm. Um, it says, please review the attached no. estimate 6196. We've been talking about, uh, what is it? Um, 6175. 6175. Yeah, 6175, sec, sec, section C, yes. section E, it says, Check on re checking on removal of cypress trees that look dead. But there's still a price given too. Yes, yeah, $75, but that doesn't mean if he removes it that that's the price. Well, we, we can have him change the wording on there, but that's what he bid was the removal of those trees. Um, and again, what, you know, what his email is saying, it, and it's not very clear could also mean if there is a permit cost to remove those trees the 75 dollars is not a permit cost that is his actual tree removal price that's what they charge us you know to remove any small trees in the park deb i walked the whole back of that b section the other day mm -hmm. and for the whole length of it every cypress tree that was there had growth starting on it because mm -hmm. they all look dead in the winter. You can't tell. They lose all their, all their foliage. There were approximately eight or 10, and I think they're pine trees. They're not cypress. That were dead right in a row. They had a big X on them, what have you. Those would definitely have to come down because right. they're a safety hazard. Right. But this has been like that for the last 15, 20 years since the, you know, since the, place has been here and I can't really see spending thirteen thousand dollars to make that any different than it already is I mean if we're going to put that kind of money in there why don't we put it to where everybody else is unhappy and if you're talking about noise barrier and so forth from Country Lakes Drive, that whole fence row butts up against Country Lakes Drive. You would have to redo that whole area back there 
with something that's going to be a noise barrier? Well, there are sections of trees that are sufficient, you know. Mm -hmm. there, there's big oak trees and other kinds of trees there that are blocking it. And then on the country lake side, there are sections that also have some trees and, and things that are helping block that light. The sections that we're talking about on estimate 6196, um, you know, we looked at all those areas, we walked them. Those are the ones that there really is no buffer. You just see a light on the back of a building shining over um, and, or, you know, potentially dead cypress trees, you know, whether they have some new growth or not. And they're dormant, they're, they look like sticks for the okay. part of the year that people are here. Well, kind of like Gary said, if we do that for that area, are we going to go around and do what people that live along another area want us to uh, uh, fix up well, in common area? Yeah, actually, why not? <laughs> well, why? Because of the budget. Well, How much money do you think we have? L let me back up. Let me back up. Okay. I went with David and Newell, Mr. Newell and the field supervisor to see myself. Um, those cypress trees should never have been, um, sorry, should never have been planted there because cypress, as you know, require a lot of rain, a lot of wet. The reason they don't hardly ever bush out, they're more stick trees than they uh, months out of the year than they are uh, full leafed out because they're in an arid place there, they're in full sun. They don't get the water that they need to be lush and green. So visually and sound-wise, those residents absolutely do not have um, the benefit of any foliage that would block anything visually or um, audibly. So that's where this all came from. Um, but those trees, Gary, if you go back there I've been back there. I have too. No, just a second. If you would go back there at once every month, you're not going to see a full foliage ever on those trees. So you're telling me the middle of the summer in the raining season, you will not there see will be a no foliage on no, those No, I didn't say that. Trees. I said you will not see a full foliage. It's very sparse. Even Mr. Newell and um, uh, the field supervisor said they look diseased. They're looking into all that. This is not final. I'm not sure we're ready to move on this, Dave, because we don't have all the information yet. So I would suggest well, that we... Yes, Pat? Excuse me. Yes. Uh, somebody mentioned the budget. We have in plants, landscaping, and sod, as of the end of March, $19,000 left in that budget, and that includes landscaping projects, and irrigation breaks. That's three months into the year. We're looking at 13000 That leaves us with $6,000 for the remainder of the year for irrigation breaks and everything else. I think we've got to really take a, a closer look at this, get rid of the dead trees. If we have some areas to put some screening in, that's one thing. But I think this, this project wasn't budgeted and is, at my opinion, out of line. I can't disagree with you on the timing right now, but it's certainly a point of reference that we could pick and choose the areas, especially those that are um, the least protected for the uh, owners. But I agree that I this, have no, no, that no this, problem with that. What do you say? I didn't hear you, Pat. I'm sorry. He has said he, he I'm sorry. I said I said, I said I have no problem with that. Right, right, right. But I, I, I don't think we have enough information. And when yeah. we get some information, I'd like to add, I, I looked at some work that tree companies have done for us. We paid Mike Clemens back um, in 2017. I'm sure his prices have changed now. But he cut down 10 pine trees and ground all of the stumps for $1,250. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. My suggestion is we continue working on this project right. and so forth, but maybe we need to look at breaking it up over two, three, four, four years. I agree. Um, but I think if we have some dead stuff, that's probably a good thing to get rid of. Okay. It definitely it's not a safety thing right now. It's not a safety thing, an emergency thing right now. Even if it's a dead tree out there, it's not hurting anything. It's been dead for longer than a year. Well. 
I, I do feel we'll probably need some maintenance on those nice oak trees because they've never had any maintenance and cleaning and thinning out to make sure they're as healthy as possible. But let's break this out. Well, yeah, because I was going to say, if we can save anything out there by trimming sure. stuff, then we should. Because we have some gorgeous oak trees in this park that right. have never been trimmed. Right. Newell's contract calls for, and I'm not sure what common areas it covers, but Newell's contract covers, um, well, it covers trimming the oak trees as part of their existing contract. They raised the canopy as right. part of their existing, exactly. to make sure that, you know, uh, if they're along the tree or along the road that, uh, you know, emergency vehicles can travel under. They've raised to 14 feet, so, uh, you know, lawnmowers and people can travel under them. But they don't uh, do a full arbor on the tree where they go in and thin it out and, and, you know, allow it to, I guess, grow better and let air flow through for hurricane season. Well, to cut this short, let's just put this yeah. on hold. We'll get more information from Newell, and then we can uh, look We're at We're talking the everything. Oak trees and all that back sure. there in that area. Sure. Put it on hold. Until we get all the information and we and we look at our funding. And we get together again as a board and discuss it? Of course, Barb. Thank you. All right. David, can you give us an update? I heard that you have from the uh, picnic table vendor. Yeah, the, the picnic tables are supposed to ship in um, like early March. Uh, apparently they don't have all of them from the manufacturer yet um, so we're really? waiting on the manufacturer to get the uh, the tables the fire pit tables shipped out here and then we'll install them once they're received but we just received that update I believe on Monday you said March oh, I'm sorry May I think you said May 19th and last month we said April right and now it's May so that it's not an essential industry and they're already paid yes Pretty bad business. Well, that's how you order, you know, if you order anything and it's not in stock, you know, you have to wait for it. If we paid with a credit card, it would have been paid up front anyway. But when we made this David. order, you know, we the understanding was that they would have them at the warehouse and then as soon as they received our check would ship out. But now the customer service person who's handling our account says, no, they're coming directly from the manufacturer and they're not manufactured yet do we so know is that gonna David. is that gonna change our shipping cost then if it's coming direct from the manufacturer no <laughs> do we know where they're being manufactured? David there no. you go probably uh, I guess China I don't know I, I don't know the answer to that <laughs> but actually that's probably accurate and everything coming out of China is delayed okay it's the way of the world right now I've been waiting for a case of toilet paper over a month. I don't want to hear it. <laughs> okay, uh, David. Why you burn? Why you burn? I didn't hear you, Pat, but it must have been a good one. I was just going to say, why you buy your toilet paper from China, Joe? <laughs> mm. okay. I really hadn't planned on it. It was supposed to be in Home, home Goods Warehouse here. <laughs> okay, moving right along. <laughs> Let's go on to our welcome center door lock options. David, and you've got, what company is that on the bids here? Uh, Coons Locksmith um, is the one that gave us this bid that's in the packet. Um, they're the only ones of, of all the, the companies I, I've talked to that have given me an actual estimate and a reasonable one at that. Uh, they just recommend putting electronic locks on the building. It's just a simple keypad. Uh, that will buzz the door open uh, when you push in whatever combination we set. So um, it's this price on here, eleven twenty-eight eighty-three is per door, and we have two sets of doors that that would require. But we, um, you know, over the years have spent many times more than that on replacing and repairing these non-powered locks that are on both of those doors. Uh, they just don't do well, and they get damaged and, and broken quite often um, so th this should cut down on some of the maintenance expenditures with the locksmith in the future the other options were all many times uh, or many thousands of dollars more per door because they wanted to put in a um, an electronic uh, access system similar to this building where you use your swipe card to get in uh, it, that requires, you know, big expensive equipment and a lot more installation costs because you have to run internet lines and things over to that area. So 
with this, um, it's a simple solution and it should be much more reliable. And it, the only additional cost is adding a couple electrical outlets above the doors and the ceiling. I just have two questions. Is there a warranty on this? And is there, um, what was the other question? Well, first of all, warranty. <laughs> I don't know the answer to that. Typically, it's a year warranty from a manufacturer on any of these things. I can clarify what it is from Coons. I have a question. Hey. Yes. Barb. Go ahead, whoever said that. I'll talk when you're done. Uh, oh, this is John. It, it says in here that the uh, customer must provide electrical outlet in the drop ceiling. Do we have any idea what that's going to cost? No. Um, I mean, estimates are... are pretty low we have power in that area already it would just be any electrician tying into a box and running a, a small conduit um, one of our electricians in the park said probably less than two hundred dollars per outlet so you know add another four hundred or so to this quote uh, you know total and right that, and, that should be and then right. also you you said this is per door and then you said there are two doors per set to so is it four times this or two times no, this it, it's per opening um so th this lock mechanism would only be on uh one door you know just just one of the two i got you right the, the same way it is now we have one lock on there that we push in a uh, a combination and it opens uh and the other sure. one is just okay. fashioned closed david when you so said i'm sorry john go ahead i thought you were done uh, it's okay i'm done thank you uh, David, when you said the other companies wanted to uh, recommend this and recommend that, did we ever try having a scope of work with exactly what Coons wants to do to let other companies actually know what we're asking for? Yeah, they don't just don't do that type of work. I didn't get another locksmith. Uh, Coons is the only one that does that? Well, uh, I can get another locksmith, but Key Security said we don't do that anymore, even though they were a locksmith company. All they recommended was the same access system that we have in this building. Action Security that's worked in this park for many years said the same thing. The last quote they gave was uh, a couple years ago, a year or two ago, and it was $9,000 for, well, total for both doors um, to put in the same system that's on this building with the swipe cards. Uh, and Cypress Access said the same thing. You know, These are access control companies more so than locksmiths. Um, I could find another locksmith that does this type of work, but Coons is just the one that has traditionally worked on this park. That uh, who's who's that? Is that Pat? Yes. That's yes. Yeah, we. I mean, we've tried looking into getting the swipe cards on these doors before. We've had nothing but trouble with those push button locks. Uh, they jam up. People jam them up. They don't work, and we usually spend. Five or six hundred bucks every time we replace one of those push button locks. Uh, Coons has been doing a work in there for years for most of these doors. I think we should just cut to the chase and get this thing fixed once and for all and go with Coons' recommendation. I agree with that, but I, I also would like to see what it's actually going to cost us to do what we need to do that they will not perform instead of it's probably. They need to put, it, put an outlet that. up there? I'm sorry? You need, well, I'm sure there's electric wiring up in that above the ceiling. And all you got to do is tap into a box and put an outlet in. You're not, you're not taking a lot of voltage. Actually, it's probably just to get 110 volts knocked down to 12 or 24 volts for, for a little transformer on a lock mechanism. I used to do this stuff. Oh, okay. I agree that it <laughs> needs to be done because those ones that we've had are just inadequate. But I just was concerned that Coons is the only one that we had a, a estimate on. I think Gary has a question. I'll make a motion that we accept this estimate and install those locks per the estimate. Second. Pat seconded. Second. Okay. I'll go ahead and do an alphabetical approval. Barb? Yes. John Genovese? Yes. Joe? Yes. Wayne? Yes. Gary? Yes. And Pat? Yes. Unanimous approval.
Please proceed, Dave. Thank you. Today's what, the 22nd? <sighs> All righty, excellent. Uh, so now let's go on to a little bit more complicated situation. Our entrance gate keypad and controller replacement options, but since we typed this, I think we're gonna be maybe delaying that a little bit because we're gonna be working with our developer on a pro. Right, so uh, right now, just to real quickly, uh, someone hit our gate controller a couple of weeks ago. We have the video, we've reached out to them. Uh, we have no price on a repair. Uh, the, the, the gate controller and call box itself works but the case is damaged in a way that now uh, you know any rain can get water intrusion in there it's beyond repair they don't make that cover anymore separately um, if we replace the whole system uh, it, it's a couple thousand dollars uh, that i've found for the 1800 series that we have in place um, but it may be time to look at an upgrade a nice touch screen system or something especially if we're going to get some money from the uh, the vendor who um, hit our gate but they you know they won't do anything until we give them a, an estimate both of our gate companies which is action and cypress access have um, been out here they know what the problem is they know what we need and neither of them have provided an estimate yet because they say that all of their vendors are closed down because of the virus and they can't get me a accurate price okay. david i'm looking at an ac action security invoice that in uh, January of 2018, and the due uh, amount of half of the deposit for that gate system was due February the 1st of 2018. I can't remember the exact date that they completed the service and we paid the other half of that. But that invoice included, and they replaced the Door King Visitor telephone entry. Deb told me that's antiquated, if 2018 is antiquated, then we are in trouble because they provide and install a new Door King visitor telephone entry unit. It includes a two-year manufacturer warranty to replace the existing older linear visitor call box. In addition, we will have to install two Door King tracker boards to allow for the existing access control card readers and barcode reader to interface with the new visitor call box. We just replaced that in 2018. So if somebody hit it, a vendor, then they need to replace it. That's what I said. That's exactly what we're doing. But we need quotes on replacing it. That is an old unit. That 1800 model has been around forever, and apparently they can't get the parts for it just to put a new cover on. So we would have to replace the entire, the entire uh, you know, unit inside and out. So we keep using action security and they use that old stuff for us. No, well, we don't. We, we, we've switched, again, we've switched over to Cypress <laughs> Access, but I reached out to Action because they know the park and said, can you give us a quote on what you recommend replacing this? You know, here's what we have. They know what we have. What can we replace our keypad with, whether it's the same thing or an upgraded touchscreen model? And we can't get an answer for either of those things right now. From action or from maybe, Cypress. Maybe they have, maybe they have an old rotary dial system they can put in. <laughs> <laughs> That's I've got what action one. would put in. <laughs> Can't we just do an empty uh, tin can and a string as well? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so there's more work to All be right. done on that because we need to work with the developer on what's going to be compatible, right? Right, yeah, they, okay. they have some different ideas about, uh, you know, how their okay. system will work, but it, it should work with anything modern. Okay, and then just quickly, uh, as we did last month, we signed a maintenance agreement with B&I HVAC to have service contracts on all of our units, and I know that they did a baseline inspection and you have not gotten the final bill or results on where we actually, when they, when they inherited right. the equipment and, and the condition, right? So right. we're waiting on that. Okay. John, do you just quickly want to give any updates to the board and community on our PM program that's near to be ready to be presented to the board? Sure. So, we have three board members uh, sitting on this committee, uh, uh, Deb, 
Gary, myself, and Mike Baker, who's the head of the facilities committee, or the chairman of the facilities committee, I should say. And basically, we are looking at literally every single asset within the park and putting together you know, what we feel might be a workable preventative maintenance system. Now, a lot of, um, a lot of the way this thing is being put together is from my knowledge of being a Xerox service technician and the documents that we used to use for preventative maintenance. Uh, anyway, so we're, we're most of the way through adding all of that stuff. Um, once we, once we get it to a point where we're pretty comfortable that it's the way we want it, uh, the plan would be to bring David, and we've talked to David and Chris through this process, but the plan would be to bring that finished document to them for final tweaks. Uh, you know, is it workable? Do the schedules make sense? So forth. And then once that's done, it, of course, would be brought to the board and then implemented. And John, I want to thank you for all the work you're doing on this. Your uh, technical ability on formatting is awesome. I know Gary's shaking his head. He's always impressed with what you're doing. But to the community, I just want to say that I think since this park has become governed, self-governed, this was the one element that we never got put together and that now we are going to have a documented, consistent, timely PM program mechanically, uh, every piece of equipment, cleanliness, appeal, you name it. Um, so I'm real excited to roll this out. And of course, David will be responsible for monitoring and enforcement of all the above. Okay. And Deb, I, I, would, yes. also, I would also say that, you know, for every employee and basically every resident, you know, there's that old saying, see something, say something. You know, if we're all pulling in that very same direction, it would be helpful, right? If you see something that's out of whack, you know, let the let the office know, hey, you know, this is broke, that's broke. And same thing for us and the same thing for the employees. If your focus is, you know, as you're walking through, mm -hmm. uh, oh, I see that or I see this, you know, see something, say something, mm -hmm. that'll go a long way and get things up to snuff right quick. As long as approached in the right manner, right? With the right frame of mind. Of course. Yes, absolutely. Of course. Okay, and before we leave the maintenance area, there was something that was left off this, but we're not ready to discuss it yet. But I want to give a heads up to the community and to the board. We're going to talk about, for just one minute, our Welcome Center pool deck area. The pool deck itself is crumbling, okay? Uh, it has never been um, maintained in the manner that it should have been maintained. And there are many cracks and many crumbling areas. A layer of about, what, quarter of an inch, mm -hmm. David? Something like Probably. that. Mm -hmm. It's a safety hazard. It's unsightly. It's not the standards that we want. David's securing bids right now for not only um, a new application, whatever it may be, but it's been discovered and not verified yet that there could be an area on the pool deck under the pool deck that is actually given way. And Dave, if I'm not using the right word, I'm sorry on that. No. But it's going to be a little bit of a costly expense. I'm not sure we're ready to discuss it at this time. I think there's a little bit more information you're trying to get on that. But I'm giving a heads up to the board and to the community uh, on the Welcome Center. I want to move into new business. We can wrap this up in about 10 minutes, and before we move on, there is a video question. Oh, okay. Uh, can I do the agenda items first? Okay. Uh, the first item uh, on the agenda, yes, John? Sorry, on, on that pool deck uh, thing, is the plan to try to get that done this uh, summer so that it's ready to go and be very nice for uh, opening? We don't have it in the budget plan. I, it, Barb's right. I mean, it's not in the budget, um, but we can certainly, I think we need to prepare ourselves for some bids so we know what we are dealing with. So when we do budget planning in October, that it's something we're going to have to consider. I believe it was on a reserve study for 2021 anyway, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, okay. it was. Yeah. Okay. 
Alrighty, so on the new business, we'll do the agenda items. Um, I was approached by Diane Leffler, our area director, Area Director, congratulations, you just got a promotion. Your Activities Director, as well as Charlie Lawrence, who's on the audio-visual team, um, about safety issues with our closet that stores all the tables and chairs. We had presented this to the board last meeting, uh, and it it is wanted to be addressed again because we have more of a safety issue. Diane, do you want to talk about that? Okay. Um, I know you wanted to maybe wait until we know what was going on with the great room and, and the expansion, if possible. However, I invite any of you board members to move a table and not get hurt. Try to put it in the rack and take it out of the rack. It is not, it's going to get somebody hurt. And to be truthful, us ladies are the ones that are doing the table moving uh, before Charlie Lawrence came around. and. I, I really would ask you to consider this $1,400 investment to, to save our backs, our toes, our shins, uh, it falling on somebody and getting hurt to, to build this rack that Charlie Lawrence and John McCormick came up with. Now this is for only the 10 foot rounds, yes. correct? It has nothing to do with the rectangles or correct. the squares, correct. so it's strictly that. And it is movable. If we do get a bigger space, we can move the ramp into the new facility. Diane, do we just lean them against each other right now Correct. on the floor? No, they're in a, a metal rack that a is about rack. a foot and a half off the ground, so you have to to get the table up onto the metal holder. And So can it be lowered? No. It's on wheels. Yes. It's not a safety. It's to, to put them into this rack, somebody has to hold the other table while the other people are trying to get that other table onto the rack. Mm -hmm. It's it's simply not safe and it's it's bad. It it just doesn't work. Charlie Lawrence came up with this rack system, ramp system that would work. And they're they're offering to build it and construct it. Deb, I believe you have the plans. I it's think just something that packet. I do have it, but it didn't look like a ramp system. It looks like something to put them in again. It's flush to the floor, so we're, it would work. So, so you basically just roll them in? I, right. I remember what it looks yes. like, Joe, because I've had to do the tables before. Diane? Gary? We've had these tables for what? A long time. 2004. I used, I used to do the same thing. 2004. And I used to set up and take down years back. How many accidents have we had since We've had them, none that I'm aware of. Well, I realize it's very heavy for a woman to do. Actually, we have hacks that have had accidents. We just haven't told you guys about them. We've gotten people that have gotten their toes run over. We've gotten uh, shins bruised and cut. Um, I, I had one rolling on somebody and it fell on them. We, you just don't report it because they're not going to the hospital, fortunately. Yeah. And and. Maybe nobody's ever mentioned it before because their social director wasn't involved in putting the tables up. I am directly up, and I'm, I'm telling you, it's a chore. Yeah, we did have men that were on the setup and tear down committee. That's for sure. I, yeah. I have a quick question. At some point, if we replace ten footers with nine footers or eight footers, no. can this be modified? I'm, I don't know that question. I asked I'm that sure. question last time, and these are built for... Tom, you guys don't have to bring that out. These are built for the current tables. Okay, and, well, and I don't that. see in the future being able to replace our, our 30 tables with, with smaller tables. We replace them with smaller tables. We're going to have to buy additional tables. So these are our tables for what I see for, the long, for a while. They're in good shape. They work. They get the occupancy we need in here. We just need help putting them away. And what John and Charlie have come up with is excellent. Is it wood and susceptible to skinning up and tearing up? Yes, it says here. Oak slats, lineage bar, plywood. It's metal edging, plywood, galvanized pipe. Deb, 
I would like to make a motion that we spend the fifteen hundred bucks. And move we on. have a motion to spend. I'll second it. John seconds it. Okay. Um, sorry, Barb. I don't have anything else. Okay, we have a motion. Does anyone? Uh, we're going to take a vote now. Okay. We have a first and second motion on building the uh, table ramp. So, Barb, your vote? Yes. John Genovese? Yes. Joe? Yes. Dwayne? Yes. Thank you. Gary? Yes. And Mr. Zolo? Yes. Let's go for it. All approved. Thank you. All Thank right. you very much. Tom Thank Nolan. you, Diane. And Diane, thank you for being so conscientious about people's well-being. I, I think we all appreciate that, especially on a safety issue. We need to get some of those young men in the park to start volunteering to exactly. do this. Have you seen them? What, yeah. the, the what young men? men? Yeah, I've seen them. <laughs> you think I don't look? Oh, sorry. <laughs> you, want to define, you want to define young? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, 50s. Oh, yes. That's right. young to me. <laughs> Just quickly, Mr. Uh, it, this isn't so quickly. This is a very serious issue that not only the board's aware of, but every owner who tries to uh, come on to these meetings, we always seem to struggle with it because of our audio-visual equipment, um, as well as during the season, we use our audio-visual equipment so much for your enjoyment, for karaoke, for dances, for uh, visual presentations, it just goes on and on. So um, our expert audiovisual chair, uh, Mr. Tom Nolan, long-term resident, uh, he has some. He's done some excellent legwork here for us, and he would like to present two bids to the community and the board here on how to improve our outdated, antiquated equipment. Okay. <laughs> Just so everyone's aware, I was tasked with finding two companies at least to check what we have, make suggestions, and give us a bid. I actually contacted three. Two responded. One is having the same problem as some of David's vendors. Their people are not working due to the virus. But I received a bid from Harmon's video to update the control pads, put in new uh, hardware to actually just make things much easier to operate and also to, to make it possible for people to show videos, play television without using our Soundboard. Their bid came to 15, 9, 30, 27, without speakers being replaced at the pool. And the reason I added that as a separate item is over the years, I've been stealing speakers from other parts of the building and replacing the ones that failed at the pool. I think we're out of ones to steal. The ones we have are. Not the speakers. Oh, yeah, the speakers are going to go from, an or the system's going to go to from analog to digital, which is the newest technology. I also received a bid from Pro Audio, but theirs for the same, the same amount of work. Theirs was 25, 855, 50, but they were also looking at relocating all the existing hardware and cabling from the Omni room into this facility. Plus, they are bid included the pool speakers. Now, if you take away the $8,000 for re relocating the existing hardware and the pool speakers, Theirs came to 14, 240, 26. And Pro Audio is actually the, the company that installed the system that is in the building now. They know the building. They have the wiring diagram. And 
Tom, let me jump in just for time's sake. Let me clear some things up. Number one, Pro Audio was the original installer. So they're correct. very familiar. They have the schematics you said, correct? Yes. And they installed the original system in 2004. Along with their bid, they were going to give a 90-day support for the new correct. equipment and training, correct? Now, as we went down these line items, the very first one is the water aerobics control CD player, right? And we're not doing that. It was decided uh, or recommended, okay, that that was not anything we needed to purchase from them. We Correct. could do an over-the-counter purchase for a lot less than that, okay? The, other, the next item is the water aerobics so they can actually have their music out there and not have to come into the Omni room in their swimming suits when cards are being played and turn the system on. We do not, you recommend that we do not invest the $1,872 because again, we can purchase an over-the-counter. And if I remember right, you felt that just those two items alone, we could probably get, instead of spending $2,600, we could do it for around 500 possibly. Am I correct on that? Correct. And that would be a social committee expense. That's good news, by the way. However, on the wireless mic, we know that those have been a problem for quite a while. So you felt that $240 is something that would really add to Correct. reliability, right? On the next page, um, you have decided since the speakers that you robbed from Peter to pay Paul, um, there are five working ones out under the pool deck, correct? Correct. That you didn't think we needed those now, but at least we have a reference point correct. to go back to. Now, on the transmission equipment and digital control, this is the heart of everything, correct? Correct. And you, you feel that this is a must uh, yes. purchase of $9,774. Yes. The next item is the ability on the HDMI switch with the audio outbuilt. This is also critical because this is not so much for meeting broadcasts, but this will give um, uh, confidence in that we can still broadcast on the big screen, TV, movies. There'll be a computer with audio. It's, it was a must as well. 1,576? Correct. Correct. So if you look at the two last items that are starred, 9,700 and 1,500, hold on here. Is that right? Oh, and the mic. 240. That adds up to 11,800. I'm yep. rounding off. Yep. Okay. And then if we do an over the counter of 500 for the first two items we talked about, you're reducing that investment down to 12,500, correct? Correct. And you would prefer to work with Pro Audio because they know our system so well. I would think that would be the prudent way to go. Okay. Joe has a question. Why are they recommending relocating everything, I assume, up to the booth? That was just a what if. I just asked them to throw that in. So we knew that was a reference point because there are some times you have to run between both areas to get a program going. That was my question, is would it be a better system if it's all in one place under one lock and key as opposed to scattered? It would, but I don't think it would be prudent to do that at this point if they're thinking about reconfiguring this building at some point. I, w I think we should, it's something that is manageable at this particular time. Okay. Tom? I have a question. Yep. Gary. Uh, that kind of was my question. If we redo this building, will all this equipment have to be redone? It'll have to well, be moved at some point because that audio room is not in the correct place. So if Where, we Wherever the stage is placed in the, the reconfiguration, the audio room should be opposite from it, not beside it. 
Okay. So some of that equipment's in the Omni room now, is that correct? Correct. So what would happen if we had all this new equipment put in the Omni room? So would it all be in one place? Mm, I don't think that's a good idea. Didn't you say that the audio room is not in the right place anyway? What did you mean this by that? I mean this thing. Correct. Yeah. What it did should you have been back by that exit sign. Hmm. If you go to any, if you go to any ma major venue, your audio is at the back of the stage. Are at the yes. Back of the stage. Correct. That room was put there in lieu of rolling our equipment into the storage room and out every time we use sure. it. Sure. So you're bas basically saying we'd install it here now, and if we redo, it would be a matter of center, just we'd have to move everything. Is that running? Correct? It'd be running wires. I don't think we should have to. Re place anything. Does this equipment there, I think somebody in the um, board audience has a question before me, so go ahead, whoever's trying to Pat, talk. Pat, is that you? Yeah, that was me. Uh, what, the touch controllers, when did we get to where you control everything with the iPads? That, that wasn't 2004. That's been in the last four or five years at least. Less, right. less but than that. But none of that's getting replaced. Pardon me? That's not getting replaced, Pat. That's oh, I saw I saw a sheet there. It said three touch controllers. That's for the PA system. Our PA system is all analog controls now. They're going to upgrade it okay. to digital. They are the wall switches right, like would... here in the great room, one in the Omni room, probably the one on the outside by the pool. Where do we have this in the budget? Okay, I, no, that's my next question. There isn't. <laughs> that's why I was just wondering if you had the budget pulled up and that you could make it. I do. I'm sitting there looking at it. I got it right in front of me. You know, I'm, uh, repairs and maintenance equipment recreation has 10000 in it. Uh, Let's see, where was the other one? I think some of that recreation uh, money is earmarked for the shuffleboard courts that were approved to be resurfaced this year. Uh, yeah. Before we said that was right. From. It's just six, six, over 6,000 there. Special projects only has 8,000 left. Pat on revenue um, through March. We'd only planned three thousand. We've collected eighty five hundred. We're six thousand over our budget on lots sold. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. I know there's a lot of there's a lot of revenue categories that were lowball, which is which is fine. It's not good budgeting, but it's it's working out fine. But uh, I mean, we're only in the third month of our of right. our year. I don't just try to find where this money comes from and goes. Pat, we could do this in stages too. If it all comes out of 2020, it doesn't really matter. No, but, maybe but we can do it over, <laughs> over a couple of years. Well, well that would make more it. sense. And, and also, it would make more sense if we have some of these things proposed when we're budgeting yes, so we know exactly it. what we're doing. So. I mean, I, I hate deficit spending. There's nothing that's broken, right, Tom, that we have to fix now? It's all just nice to get it upgraded. It's all antiquated. Yes. Yes. Well, but you are correct. Yeah, everything I mean, is working stuff. at the moment. No, not everything is working at the moment. The iPad's quit now. Today. I'm not sure we're in a position to make a decision today, but I think the board needs to go and look at our budget and see if if we do need to uh, reconsider it right now, but also plan for it in increments, maybe do some this year, next year, but we have information that will help us. You have a blueprint. It's excellent. You have done a great job on this. Uh, also, Deb. What? 
if we were, if if we wait, if we look at you know a couple more months out and see where we are cash flow wise, because I agree, like you said, we got we got that pool deck, which I think we have uh, that that's probably we got in your reserve. Plus, it, we also are going to have to refurbish the uh, welcome center pool. Mm-hmm. Maybe not this year, but that's going to be in the reserve too. Correct. So we'll see where we are cash flow wise. We can probably get some of this stuff done. You know, the, I think we're up a little, little more walking than running. Yeah, we may have that backflow preventer too. That could be very expensive. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I'd like to suggest that if uh, Tom would break this out with what you think we need to do sooner than later, you know, maybe break I it can up. Prioritize and I can prioritize them. I will let you know. Prioritize it. Yeah, I will. Because that may help because we're able to get some of it done yet this, this, this year and then budget for it next year. I don't think any of us is saying no. I'm just, I think we're all saying it's just a matter of figuring it out first, okay? John? Yeah, do we have any idea of, you know, what kind of project time-wise this is? I mean, if they started on a Monday, would they be out of here by Friday or is this a multi-week thing or? We got all summer. <laughs> Depends if you well, do no, it I know that. that's, what, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, no, I understand that. I'm kind of getting at it would be kind of great if this were done, if possible, at mm -hmm. all, right before the new season. So yeah. you don't have contractors in the building. We'll, we'll visit it again probably in August or September after we get at least six months under our belt to see where we are. So is that okay with everyone? Excellent. Yes, sounds good. Thank you. Um, okay, we had a late request. They wanted to get it in last month, but they didn't. And we're not at a position, again, to make a decision, but I want to include this in on new business. Uh, one of our owners, Guy uh, Desrochers, uh, has submitted on behalf of our Section C that they would like for the board to consider a night lighting uh, program over there and uh, I believe in your packet um, he even copied a traditional carriage lamp that uh, light that uh, is pretty much familiar over in double D section there and I can't speak for the entire board on this but I would assume that this can't be isolated to just one section it would have to be considered a park-wide project um but if anybody wants some short discussion on this right now that would be great Deb? but this is individual lots yes in between lots uh or, Pat, yeah. every other lot what when 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 c was built were there lights put in there Barb, do you know if there were lights? I know a lot of not, people removed lights. Other, other than the main street lights, the only lamps that you see out there are ones that individual owners have put in. Right. Same in Okay, because my neighbor just replaced his street light, his patio, or, you know, lawn light. Mm -hmm. Deb, uh, seeing where we just got this and really haven't had a chance to look at it, I suggest we table it and so we can discuss it some more. I agree. And bring it up at a, another meeting. Sure. Everybody agree? I agree. We'll table yep. this to yep. get yep. more information. But it is a good idea. He talked to Park me wide. in person before they left here. I think all of us that live in A, B, or C agree it's pretty dark. Well, out in the, the first D, they have them installed by the developer. That's and right. believe it or not, last night after dark, I checked just to see how many people leave their electric on with that street light on. And it's amazing how, much, how many are on and the people are gone. And brighter. it's great. It's yeah, great lighting. For safety reasons. Now, the very last item that's not on the agenda, I had this delivered to my lot last night. Uh, and. Oh, wait, we have a video question. No, it was a comment that came in. It's being delayed. Um, the only thing was on the pool deck. Welcome center pool deck. Correct. Kim Dawson um, just asked that if you were going to do this project, can the work please be done out of season? That's it. Oh, of course. I have something, too. I know you got to. You, you said it's the it last. Understand. Well, it's something that Diane can probably answer too, and David can answer. Back in 2018, when we uh, did our um, social or our uh, park directories, 
the board of directors agreed to pay for the directories when they were ordered. And then once they were sold, that money was to go back into HOA funds. That was 1035.24 back in 2018. And then now 2019, we did the same thing with almost the same money, uh, 10,010.71 from the same company for the latest directories that were printed. Two things, I know that Diane, you've talked about a nicer directory including pictures, blah, 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 and I know you're working on that. But I wanna know, did we get the funds back in the HOA for both of these just now? This is not for 2018 unless it went in that would have been before I was. I left it, did not. Yeah, well, it wouldn't go to that line item. It may have been put into miscellaneous at some point, just put in with one of Tina's deposits. Diane, did you pay a thousand something to the office from for social two. committee funds in 2000? For 18, you wouldn't have been there. No, I was okay. here, but no. Okay, um, so it's I not been how paid. Miller reimbursed Tina Swanson. Just like Dave said, it went into. Uh, we did turn it back in. We did sell all the directories, so we did cover the cost for that. Okay. This year, we do have one box of directories left over, so we didn't quite carry the cost, but we will continue to sell those next year. The money was just turned in this morning to Dave. Uh, we just closed out the directories, so the money did go back, and he'll put it, he'll do what he does with the money. Okay. That is not into the social committee. Yeah, I knew it wasn't supposed to go, but I didn't. I had tried to follow up and didn't find it anywhere. Barb, real quick, what line item would you like this uh, put into in the budget? As long as it's section? identified, I don't care which line item you put it in. As long mm -hmm. as it's identified on the deposit that mm -hmm. that's what it's for. You can put it in Santa Claus land as long as it's in HOA funds. I, I, that's not the issue. I just want to make sure we have it documented that it went back in. Okay. Because, you know... Um, that's just what was planned, and there's only, what, 50 directories, and we have 473 sites, so you know that everybody's not wanting a directory, but that was just my main thing. We printed 200 each time, each I, year. I believe so. I don't Maybe, think that's what Diana, was done this I year, but I don't know. Prior we did. To we yeah, printed you did. 200. The quantity is 200, yes. I learned something in a um, seminar that Joe and I, and maybe Gary, I don't know who listened to it, um, Monday, and it was presented by an attorney by the name of DeBost, and it was HRA rules and regulations uh, based on 720 document. And one of the things that was discussed was directories. And they're very common, they're very useful, but something that we didn't understand before. As an association, we have the right to print 100% of all the owner's names and addresses only in the directory. If they so want their phone numbers and their emails included, we do have to get an approval on that. Um, we ha don't have good participation in the directory. There's a lot of people who aren't in there because we thought we had to have approval for name and address as well. So going forward, 720 allows us to put 100% of the owner's lot number, which is part of the address, the address. Now I'm going to assume, no I shouldn't assume, what address would we put in the directory? Would we put Florida address, Northern address? What would we do? Both of them are a matter of record, by the way. As long as it's a matter of record and it doesn't have personal, like telephone numbers, social security numbers, or anything like email can't be, can't be considered. But I think, I know that you and Carol Gorell are working on that. I wanted to make sure that you heard the same thing I did, correct? I did. I okay. Did. Here I am, devil's advocate again, Deb. What if we have 30 owners that don't want to be in the directory, period? Are we going to say, well, we can do it because the law says? I doubt. Okay. No, we do have to do allow you, you them to opt to? out. No, yes. to, oh, to, yeah, to opt out. It, well, uh, of all of it. They could say, I don't want my name in there, period. That's correct. But you don't need permission to put them in until they say that. And even then, once they're printed, you don't have to go back and retract them. Mm -hmm. So. Diane? We have a form that is pretty 
covering all the spaces. Good. It gives you permission to put the name, address, phone number, email, emergency contact, and they can select what they want in the directory or not want in the directory. Cool. Does it say so on that? Yes, form. Yes, okay. it does. And they Give have the to information sign it. you want Correct. to disclose. And okay. before we start a new directory, a new form will go out to each resident. I Excellent. know that in the past you have discovered that or created it like that, Diane. So Good. if you don't get a form back, you just put their name and address in. Um, <laughs> I got one more. It, I'm done. Hey, Deb. In the uh, HOA website, if you go to the directory, you go to your name, there is a little checkbox for remove me from the directory. Looks like it's already there. Okay. Okay. Excellent. We have one more item. Um, as I said, it was delivered to my door last night uh, for new business. This was presented uh, by Jim Roop and George Pokinghorn both of them uh, long-term residents. Um, these gentlemen are the ones who spearheaded the beautiful new flag, lighted flag that we have on the property in the court area. Um, and um, excellent patriots as well. This is dated April 21st of 2020 to the Cypress Woods Board of Directors. Re we respectfully submit this proposal to allow the lowering of our flags to half staff upon the death of our community's United States veterans. While this practice is not within flag protocol, it has been a common military practice since 1867 and continues to this day. We are a private community, not a government agency, and as such, should be allowed to show this demonstration of respect and mourning respectfully submitted. So I'm going to open it up for discussion. They're asking... Who is that from, Deb? I'm George sorry. Pokinghorn Pokemon and Roo. Jim Roo. So I will open it up for discussion on the board. Deb, I'd like to just, just make a motion that, that we do this. I I'll second think it's it. the appropriate thing for the park. Okay. Can I uh, go ahead and take a vote then to accept this protocol as suggested? Um, Barb? Yes. John Genovese? Yes. Joe Regenstein? Yes. Dwayne Truitt? Yes. Gary Washburn? Yes. And Pat Zolo? Pat, are you still there? I think we lost Pat. Yeah, Pat's gone. Earth calling Pat. Pat. Pat's gone. Okay, we gone have. Lunch. Five of the six votes, it has been passed that Cypress Woods will have its flag protocol to honor any U.S. veteran uh, citizen here that uh, has passed. Barb, did you have something else? Uh, I don't believe. Oh, yes, I, <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> when you ask about that money, David, brought to mind our Bank of the Ozarks account, mm -hmm. that since you came on board, none of those kinds of cash funds have ever been deposited, no action, no activity in that account. And that's what that account was created for, things like that, that are cash over and above what we need to keep in the safe. Mm -hmm. So I would suggest we start using that and you put it in there. We, yeah, we made a uh, rather large deposit into that account in December, it was like December 31st actually, it was a year-end deposit of any, any of the uh, laundry and things December like that. December 31st of 2019? Yes. 2019. Oh. You did, I sure missed it because I had the... Okay. Well, if, if it's not in there, I have the deposit slips, and I'll, I'll send it over to uh, Celestin and okay. see if he can, you know, update our financials with it. But it was done the last day of the year as a final deposit and sent to him, and then we also, um, you know, we have the laundry money now. But you last said time, Celestin, who's that? Our GL person at First Service. He's the one that makes all of our, he creates our financials and things every month. I think we have uh, a, an inquiry from video. Linda Washburn wants to know, lower the flag for how many days? I believe Good the question. Three days, I believe, is what Jim had said. Yes. Is it saying in the letter? For it does days? not. 
Well, he, he was recommending three days. That's what they did uh, this last time and what they've done any other time. Okay, I have a question. When we have protocol accepted like this, it's not a rule, it's not a reg, it's not a policy. What do we do with this? Anybody got an idea? I missed the first part of that. Well, it is a policy, you know. Can we adopt it as a policy then? Mm -hmm. I, I think we need documentation on when this was policy was going to put in effect and date. Yeah, that's more we of do. an administrative policy. Um, so we, you know, put it on file. We can upload it onto the internet. We can let everyone know that it's there. Uh, it wouldn't be recorded with the county in rules and regs or anything like that. It's just an administrative right. item. So I'm just going to give you this document, this request, and I'll put three days on this. And you can handle it. And I'm back on the money again. Um, the money that you said in December that you gave to First Services to put in there, do you realize that Bank of the Ozarks is not a bank that First Services uses? Right. Actually, it is. And I didn't give it to First Service to put into the bank. I deposited it locally at the branch because most of it was quarters from laundry. That's uh, that's what I was going to say. Right. So it was, you're it the was one a, that is supposed to make the deposit. Yeah, it was a cash deposit locally, and then we send the deposit slips with the GL code to to the put GL it in the bank account. Okay, gotcha. to, to show. The, so the money goes in the bank, but they show which um, income item it would go to, which is laundry and uh, uh, the other one's miscellaneous income. Exactly. Some other thing. And Be would you please send me a copy of that for our bank of Bank of the Ozarks deposit? Because I it, it's not in our. I have the deposit slips I'll send you. Okay. Okay. Before we close, I just wanted to uh, ask our developer, Dwayne Truitt, if he has any uh, updates that he would like to pass on to the community. If not, I understand it was short notice or no notice. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we're, we're moving along as far as all the processes to, uh, to carry out development. We submitted our... Um, Zoning amendment application in February. Got a round of comments back from the Dwayne, county. Dwayne, can I stop you a minute? Some, no, we, go ahead, I fixed it. Okay, now we're okay. We were having a, an overfeed and we couldn't understand you. It was Pat. He's back. Oh, okay. Pat, I muted you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we submitted our zoning amendment application to the county in February. Got comments back in March. We responded to those comments uh, earlier this month. Everything appears to be on track. Uh, what we don't know is how COVID will affect the processing of our zoning amendment because the zoning amendments do require two public hearings, and public hearings are, you know, uh, questionable until, you know, relaxation of, of social distancing starts to uh, kick in. Um, we also are getting ready to submit our permit applications um, for the actual construction. Uh, they go both to the county and to the state uh, through the water management district and we anticipate getting those submitted by the end of this week and uh, of course the big question mark everybody has is how is COVID affecting the real estate market and the answer is nobody knows um, it's really difficult to uh, you know to be able to tell how that's going to affect you know um, the market, we, we do believe that probably it won't impact RV rentals very much, but it may impact RV lot sales. So we'll just have to play it by air and see how that goes. But that's, other than that, that's what we have going. Thank you, Dwayne. We appreciate it. One and question, Dwayne, if I could. Do you have any idea how far back your public hearings are pushed? Do you have any idea? We have no idea at this time. It'll be up to the county. Uh, we basically have to complete the staff processing, which hopefully will be completed after this second round that we just went through. And then once that takes place, then uh, the development director notifies the the, uh, the planning board. They, they're the first hearing, and then the second board is the county commission. So is it safe to say that you're not going to be moving dirt over the summer or not right away at least? We don't know. We don't know. Um, I mean, we can't move dirt until we get the permit. The permit, fortunately, doesn't require public hearings. So, um, and we're we're pretty much on schedule for that. So perhaps we could have a permit in hand 
um, you know, by, say, June. Um, but the other thing, of course, is we have to secure construction financing in order to actually go build something. And our lenders are right now saying, hey, wait a second, let's see how this market's shaking out. So uh, <laughs> we, we, had a, um, we had a commitment from the bank to actually do all that financing and then COVID hit. So we'll just have to, you know, figure out what's going on just like everybody else in the world is. Don't take this the wrong way, but I'm glad it's your problem, not mine. <laughs> I think I Gary. Wish you luck, Dwayne. Gary, you have a question? No, but I'd like to make a motion. We adjourn the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> I second. So moved. And we'll get our notices out when the next meeting is. <laughs>